right. All right. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. It'll uh, take a few minutes for the signal to go out and everybody to jump on the live chat, but there's already a bunch of people in the chat, so it's good seeing everyone. Of course, uh, Ryan probably needs no introduction for the people that don't know Ryan. Ryan is a, uh, a D.B. Cooper aficionado. He's an attorney in the great state of Mississippi, one of my favorite states. And, uh, you know, like Ryan always says, he says uh, he's not an avid golfer. He's a D.B. Cooper guy. So that yeah. is his his uh, his thing. And he knows it extremely well. And he's my go to for all things D.B. Cooper, like the FBI files. He's 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 the man. And I put a link to Ryan's website in the comment section or in the information section. General Burnside. That's right, Patty. <laughs> Check out Ryan's great site. You can also find him on the D.B. Cooper Mystery Group page on Facebook where he uh, holds court and puts up a lot of interesting stuff. And, and we'll definitely get into some of that uh, tonight and what you were discussing yesterday with, with, uh, with Marty, which was a, which is a great show, which we're, what they were doing was uh, is, uh, Ryan was drawing just random suspects out of a bag. And then uh, either him or Marty would have to defend that suspect, even if it was not some of your, some of their favorite suspects, they still uh, tried to put a good light on it, which was, was just great because it makes you think, more about some of these guys are not as bad as you initially think. Uh, uh, you know, like you were just saying, you know, uh, Rekka is not, you know, he's, he's a lot, he's a lot of fun to make fun of. And we're going to definitely make fun of him tonight because that's just good. One, one thing you and I enjoy doing. But <laughs> So we're always going to do it. It's a, it's a non guilty pleasure to make fun of Walter Rekka uh, just because <laughs> of the, crazy. you know, some of the stuff that comes up with him, but you know, but the, like every suspect out there has at least something going for him. So that was a, who, oh. that was a great idea. Uh, to, to just to do the random suspect thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, some of them are better than you think. I mean, like, you know, when you try to actually, you know, think through them and debunk them, I mean, some of them aren't as easy to debunk as you would think. I mean, someone like Gossett, for example, is not, you know, as bad as you would think. I mean, there's not, a, I mean, he doesn't have a lot of silver bullets that are true silver bullets, you know on gossip just his personality is weird but you know what hijackers are weird just to begin with a lot of them so yeah which you're finding out a lot about because you know you're writing a book and it's it's with the heavy folk of db cooper book of course and when the book comes out you're definitely coming on this show and what you're really focusing on is a lot of things about the copycats uh and what yeah. and what they experienced and what they did and what that brings back to helping to identify of course db cooper that's the main the, the obviously the main goal is to uh, learn more about guys that actually did this jump and did they have any experience uh, like Martin McNally that you've gotten to know very well that you're good with now, a guy that actually jumped out of a Boeing 727 and um, lived through, lived, lived to tell. So tell me again how like how you found Mac. And I know you found him through Facebook, but what was that first yeah. experience like when you were talking to a guy that actually hijacked an airplane? Very, very cool. I did ha I had no expectations that he would respond to my message because it's hard to, you know, on Facebook, on Facebook, it's hard. Did my, okay, my, my video went out briefly. Anyway, uh, on Facebook, it's hard to like, if you message someone and you're not friends with them, it goes into almost like a spam, you know, thing, yeah. folder, sort of. You know, where so I had no expectations of so I just wrote him a, I wrote him a brief message saying, Hey, uh, are you the Martin McNally who hijacked flight 118 or whatever? And um, sure enough, a minutes later, I got a response, Hey, yeah, it's me. You know, you uh, give me a call if you want. I was like, He said, Here's my number. I said, Oh, okay, well, sure. So I, I literally called him minutes after that and uh, I talked to him for about three hours and He's become a real close friend of mine. I mean, I talk to him on the phone every week. I mean, he's a single guy, never had any kids. He's 80. He'll be he'll be 80 years old this year. Um, never had any kids or anything. So he's just watches TV. Uh, whenever you call him, uh, he he always he goes, hold on a second, because he has to like find the <laughs> controller and like mute the TV. Right. So it's always like, hold on a second, you know, and then he and then he realizes who you are because he will answer the phone his cell phone. He has like an iPhone, but he doesn't like know who you are until you start talking. He goes, Oh, Ryan, how you doing? But no, Max great. And, and um, I'm actually going to uh, meet him out there in Seattle a few days before CooperCon. 
Wow, uh, that's going to be go, great that you guys got a yeah. Coopercon. Because it would be the yeah, first Coopercon that actually had a real living hijacker well, address the group. Yeah, I mean, there's only two wow. alive. I mean, you know, Rob, you know, Rob Hedges is still alive. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the point died in 2003 or so. McCoy's dead. Heineman died in, like, 92. So they're all, I mean, Hedium and, and Mac are it. And, you know, they couldn't be further apart. You know, Rob Heady literally, like, this was a thing apparently in the 60s. I don't know if it still is now. But, you know, they used to have intramural skydiving competitions, like actual NCAA intramural skydiving championships. And Rob Heady was the NCAA skydiving champion. Wow. Um, so I didn't even know the NCAA Mac, had skydiving. I didn't know either. And so whereas Mac had literally never even put on a parachute. So they couldn't be further apart as far as their, you know, and, you know, Rob was a educated guy. Rob you know, became an accountant in prison. Um, you know, Rob came from a, you know, all the, I mean, Mac came from, you know, what's interesting about Mac is Mac came from a family of like eight kids and all of his siblings are all like pharmacists and lawyers and he was kind of the black sheep. Uh, he had a pretty bad time in the, in the military. He had some PTSD stuff from um, a plane there crash. A fire? It basically, oh, it was a plane crash. That's right, the fun, fire yeah, from a plane he, crash. He, yeah, basically, he was on an airplane crew with about 10 other guys. He was on what's called a PB-2 Neptune, which is like a sub spotter in the Pacific. He was stationed in Seattle and Alaska for several years. And uh, he got sick one day. And uh, his... That day, his plane crashed, and all of his crewmates wow. died. And he had to go actually pick up the bodies. Um, he had he was taken out to the crash site to pick up the bodies of his crewmates who he had been with for over a year or whatever. So he, he had a lot of like PTSD from that, and it kind of he came back really different from the Navy. But he was stationed out there at Whidbey Island, north of Seattle. And so him and I are going to rent a car on Thursday before CooperCon. Oh, he wow. wants to go drive out there, and so I'm trying to I'm in communications now with the. Uh, with the uh, information officer at Whidbey Island to let Mac get on the base. So again, because he wants to go see the, his, you know, because he, I mean, he stayed there for about three years uh, from like 62 to 64. That's so going to be cool. cool. Yeah. Just having yeah, I mean, a, it, because well, you've talked a lot, Mac, but you, but you haven't met him in person yet. No. And what's interesting about Max about Mac is that, you know, he got his ass kicked uh, by the FBI when they caught him because he, it's important to remember, you know, the Bing Crosby sketch, the famous sketch, looks like somebody in their late 20s, right, or early 30s. And so the and so FBI agents across the country, if, if the sketch is all they had to go on, then, you know, they're assuming that somebody like Mac, who was 28 years old, could be Cooper. Um, and so when they caught Mac, and realized that he had served in Seattle for three years. And, you know, Max, literally his job uh, on uh, his job in the Navy was to fly from the Canadian border down to south of Portland and back. Wow. So he knows Tacoma, hours. Tacoma by the yeah. air, no problem. Oh, my God. And New Portland, I mean, he was, you know, they flew on, I mean, they, you know, he flew along the coast. You know, he spent 2,000 hours in that aircraft. And that was his job. And so, living in Seattle and his brother still lived in Seattle in 1971. So he had these connections and they considered him as being possibly Cooper. Um, so he got his ass kicked a lot, um, you know, by the FBI. That's first, interesting like, because he, you know, he was looked at as a, as a, a viable DB Cooper and now, you know, and how bad they were really looking for Cooper. Yeah. And what's interesting about Mac is people will joke with him. It is not funny to Mac. To bring up Cooper, like if you suggest that he was Cooper or whatever, he didn't think it's funny at all. Um, oh, because wow. this guy who spent thirty, I mean, this guy who spent thirty-eight years in prison for a hijacking, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he gets really touchy about because he's like, "No, I'm not, I'm not Cooper." He's like, "Don't say that," you know. He's like, "No." Yeah. And he gets Even really if you joke about it, he doesn't like it. It's not. He doesn't like no. it. It's like something that just no, to stay because away. he's still like. It's almost like he still has this. You know, hell, if I spent four decades in prison, you're going to be yeah. Sure like I don't, shot. yeah. He's he, he doesn't want to go back. <laughs> no. He doesn't want to get roped into that. But the interesting about yeah. thing about Mac was is that he, like you said, he never jumped before. He was never had one skydive. He learned about what he went to the library and he learned terminal velocity or something, and that was yeah. He learned how to his, work uh, his body and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So he just kind of timed it when he jumped, and before he jumped, 
Uh, how much ran? He was a half a million too, wasn't he? Like McCoy wasn't. Now, what was his ransom? Yeah, he had five hundred and two thousand dollars, which actually makes him the most profitable skyjacker in history. Uh, he got away. He got t- got away briefly, I guess, with uh, more money than anybody ever in history. Um, what were the denominations? I, uh, um, I don't know. Was it was it a mixed? big ass bag, though. It was a, it yeah. was a forty-five. It was a forty-five pound bag, so it, it might have been twenties. Because if Cooper's bag was twenty-one pounds and he had two hundred thousand. It's probably in max bag was 45 pounds. It's probably 20s. Um, the same as Cooper, I would think. Man, that was just a, a heavy, huge bag of money, of course. So, right, I love this part. Right before Mac was going to jump, he, 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 he was having second thoughts, right? And then he just, just yeah, he was hanging. It, right? Well, what's funny is we have this image of Cooper as, you know, going down the stairs, you know, probably throwing a cigarette out, you know, and just, like if it was Braden, he would just ball swing and just fuck it, you know, he'd be gone, right? But McNally uh, was so terrified that he crawled backwards down the stairs on his belly. Yeah, I love that. And, yeah, and he's <laughs> hanging <laughs> like a child. He's, he, he finds himself hanging like a child from a jungle gym, you know, on the very last step. And he's like, oh, I don't want to let go. And he finally let go because he said, look, if I'm sitting here holding here, if I'm holding here and some guy – from if some cockpit crew member comes back with a gun, he could just shoot me in the, in the head, right? I'm sitting there hanging here. So he just decided to let go. And when he let go, he timed, he counted about 10 seconds. He wanted to like, you know, he kind of thought before of, he pulled the rip cord. Yeah. And when he pulled the rip cord, uh, his, for one thing, all they gave him were chest reserves. They didn't even give him any backpacks. Right. I remember that. So he had no back. They gave just, him, I think, just, six, no backs, just fronts. So they gave him like six fronts. And uh, what's fascinating about him is his version of Tina was a, was a woman named Sharon. His version of Tina had been a skydiver, had been skydiving. Um, oh, so wow. she knew, yeah, she actually helped him with the harness and stuff, which is kind of funny. Um, but but when he, when, he, when he pulled his parachute, for one thing, he was looking down. So the parachute hit him in the face, for one thing, hit him, hit him mm-hmm. in the face first. And then when it fully deployed, uh, it ripped off the bag. And so he lost his money bag. It just came off. That, of that's how. Off okay, that's how he lost. That's how he lost the money bag. Yes. And, the and so, I'll show this. So this is. Um, I asked Mac the other day. I said, Mac, I want you to draw me what you looked like. Like, how did you carry the bag? I mean, this, this is a thing that we can only find out from a, a real life Cooper. How from the guy that did it yourself. Yeah. And so, I, I reversed this image. Let me see if it'll pop up. Uh, this is what he texted me. He drew me a picture. I said, draw a picture and text it to me. And this is, I think, uh, let me see, where's my camera? Yeah, I can see that. Like right there, you could, perfect. Yeah, I'm so not it's sure kind of like, or not. it's on his leg well, or is it? Yeah, like maybe the camera. Thigh? Yeah, yeah let, me, let me see. I reversed that on purpose because I thought maybe the camera would would, 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 would mess it up. Let me try this again. See if, uh, yeah, there we go. It says Mac Pirate. Mac Pirate 72. 45 pound bag. You know, he had some. It's like on his thigh, you know. Yeah, and you see the top loop is tied to his belt. Yeah. There. So what he did, it was really ingenious, is that um, he, the the bag they gave him was this big, like heavy, like mail bag, and it had a leather handle at the top. So what he did is he ran his like he ran he took his belt off and like you know and, and like looped it and looped the on the leather through his belt. Yeah. And since his belt up, that way it's going to stay on your body. Right. There's no way you can. But he didn't realize that his belt wasn't stitched. It was snapped. It like had like cheap. It was a cheap belt he had grabbed. So it, so when he opened the chute, these like snaps snapped and it fell apart. But it was actually a clever way to tie it to himself. Yeah. Um, this but, this uh, Schmidt TV is asking, was McCoy the only guy who didn't lose the money? That's a good question. No, um, no, he was, uh, in fact, Mac's um, the only guy who Mac lost Heineman. the money. Yeah, well, Mac no, Heineman, lost it. No, no, Heineman made it to the ground with the money. And it, it, yeah. it's still a mystery how he, they recovered it a year later. And it's still really mysterious how they got the money back. But the FBI. I never heard that. How did it? So, of course, you know, Heineman, another well-known uh, hijacker. He went to, what did he go to, Honduras or something? Honduras, I mean, was, yeah. Yeah. He hijacks the 727 
uh, makes it over to Honduras. He, uh, of course, he he gets out. He makes it to the ground with the money, and then he, he winds up turning himself in because they were the you know, man house was in on. Because yeah, the the Honduran government put out a thing like you know we'll give we'll give ten thousand dollars dead or alive. So when when there's a literal uh, price on your head in a banana yeah. republic, you're, you're yeah, they don't play games. No, you're fearing a literal beheading by machete. You know, yeah. so yeah. Don't he play turned around. himself in. Yeah. Yeah. He turned himself into the embassy and said, Hey, I'm 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 Bill Heineman. <laughs> you know, but he was an odd character. Um, but no, McCoy didn't lose the money. Uh LaPointe had the money, made it to the ground. Everybody made it to the ground with the money except for Mac. Yeah, and maybe Cooper. And maybe <laughs> Cooper, know. yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, I, I, I don't think he. I think he, my personal opinion, I, I, since we're talking about Cooper, is I, I do think he may. I do think he lost it, just personally. I, I really, you think I he lost know, it all? I yeah, I, I don't know how the money gets to Tina Barr, you know, flippantly like that. You know, it, that's, you know, it, it's. I think the money ended up in the river somehow. I don't, I don't know how. Um, and, and you know, Cooper didn't jump anywhere near the river. Is the problem? He jumps right seven eight, seven eight miles north of the river. Um, but I have theories on it, but it's too embarrassing to admit. So yeah, well, that brings up your flight. <laughs> there it is, right there. You know, yes. I can see. You know, we're kind of heading south to Seattle. You know, <laughs> and then it, it yeah, just does this really crazy <laughs> thing and finds yeah, out, for you know, those who don't Portland, get the joke. The it, yeah, for those <laughs> know, don't get the that. for those don't get the joke. Basically, it, <laughs> my friend Eric Ulis has a interesting thought on. He has been making his own flight path called the Euless flight path. And so uh, I decided to make the Burns flight path uh, with my favorite. <laughs> I love that. With my I favorite out of my chair when I saw that. Because <laughs> yeah, obviously McCoy was not Cooper, but that's the joke. Yeah, yeah that, that's awesome. our joke. That's one of our inside jokes. It's like everything inside always jokes, turns. Yeah. It, it just turns up McCoy for everybody. Everything's McCoy. Yeah, everything's McCoy. But yeah, the um, I would say, uh, let's see. If somebody says, uh, What's Ryan mean by his version of Tina? Okay, so every Skyjacker basically had a stewardess that they used to uh, ferry the notes and things. Um, you know, whereas like, like Tina sat with Cooper the whole time, Mac had a stewardess named uh, Sharon Weathersby um, who did this. Um, McCoy used, uh, McCoy's woman was named, I believe, Diane Sturdum. But they all had these like, stewardesses that they kind of kept captive in a way um and max max was funny max uh stewardess was cute she uh uh when max plane listen for those who don't know when mac was taking off when mac received five hundred two thousand dollars and he said fly to canada when his 727 was taking off a local drunk who was tired of watching skyjacking news on tv crashed his cadillac through two gates at the airport and rammed Max 727, uh, literally crashed at 80 miles an hour, crashed into Max 727 and crippled it. Uh, of course, Mac is like, what the hell happened? But Max wig in, in the collision got knocked askew. And uh, the stewardess said that she straightened his wig out for him. <laughs> Just kind of a funny detail. And of course, Max, it, Mac, the pilot testified that Max shouted out, God damn, that guy's crazier than I am. <laughs> that is the craziest. I mean, that's like wilder than anything with Cooper. I mean, Cooper is obviously the most famous, but if you look at Mac with the, the oh, deal, the guy dr literally driving his car on the, the, the runway, runway going at the plane because he's pissed off because this guy's holding up his flight or whatever. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah. You know? Yes, and then you go was, to the, yeah, he was at the bar drinking because his flight was delayed or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And he's just pissed off. So he just gets in his car and he's going to play chicken with it, with the, with the airplane. Trying no, to screw and, Mac, and up. Mac too. I always tell people so. So Max alias was yes, and they gave Mac another plane. Max said, "Get me another 727." That's why Mac was convicted uh, twice. He had two 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 hijackings for the same day because he hijacked. Oh, the they, second they got plane. him for two because of that because they, because he mm -hmm. hijacked the first one and then they he, they gave him another plane. Yeah, and Mac got to the next plane basically hiding under a blanket. He got under a blanket with two stewardesses and like kind of went over and uh, yeah. yeah and they didn't shoot him um and uh he almost he 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 was it was a crazy story but no odds are basically listen so robert wilson was his alias he used the name robert wilson 
which you ask him again, this is very Cooper's things because I can ask a real life Cooper, did you have any inspiration for your alias? He says, no, just something I thought of that would. Yeah, be that, that's interesting. Yeah. How they came up with their aliases. Yeah. Just Robert Wilson. So those don't know of the copycats, uh, Bill Heineman's alias was George Ames. Uh, LaPointe's alias, uh, Richard LaPointe's alias was John Shane. Uh, McCoy used T. Johnson. Some people say it was James Johnson, but it's Yeah, I used T. to always Johnson. hear James. I would have said James if you asked me. Yeah, but it, it, every all the FBI files, If you when you, when you when you look at the 800 pages of McCoy, it's T. Johnson was his alias. Yeah, it's not even a J, so who knows where the James comes from. I don't know where that came from. That must have been a erroneous report, kind of like D.B. Cooper. Is wow, that I mean, that's a, that's a cool stuff you find out when you really dig into it. But yeah, that, that was a brilliant thing to ask the copycats is how you came up with your alias. Oh, I mean, because look, I mean, and, and, and look, I, a Cooper. I, yeah, and like uh, I asked Mac about his mystery bag. You know, Mac had a mystery bag just like Cooper did. I said, "What was in your little bag you had with you?" Mac had gloves, rope, a pistol. Uh, maybe some like water or something. Uh, I mean, maybe, oh yeah. Um, he had a, he had like a, a, a collapsible shovel. Uh, no, no, no. The collapsible shovel was part of his request. He wanted the shovel to be brought. Like, he was going to bury yeah, it. Military type. Yeah. I asked Mac the other day what you were, what, what your plan was. His plan was to bury the money, uh, hot wire a car, drive back to Detroit from wherever he landed. And Mac was winging his drop zone. He had no idea where he was jumping. Just like, just, I, I think Cooper was doing the same thing. He just, you know, jumped wherever, wherever he thought was he, he should jump. Um, Mac's plan was to go to, back to Detroit, park the stolen car in his garage, get his car, drive to Canada and watch the news for about two weeks and see what was going on and then drive back to wherever he was and get the money. But the thing about Mac is that, you know, as we say, we would not be the D.B. Cooper Facebook mystery group if Mac got yeah, away. I love, it. I love that Wilson statement. Group. Yeah. I mean, we'd be the Robert Wilson group because, again, we know now that the first person that Mac encountered on the ground, when Mac got on the ground, uh, he hit his head pretty bad. It gave him a concussion. And he yeah. So he like 12 hours. Right. He was like in a field somewhere. There's somebody's he farm. He crawled into the woods with yeah, his parachute. kind of hit himself, and he passed out for like 12, yeah. 12 hours. Yeah, and when he woke up, he starts walking down the road, and the first person who pulls up to him is literally the sheriff of that county. This is in Indiana. Uh, uh, but you couldn't write a crazier script. No, no. and and he can he plays that the sheriff's like, hey man, you shouldn't be hitchhiking. There's a skyjacker about. And, <laughs> and Max's like, well, could you give me a ride into town? And, the and he's obviously the banged up. I mean, he's obviously, you could tell that he'd been yeah, through an ordeal. Yeah, from his parachute. And he told the uh, he told the uh, the sheriff that he had been in a fight with his brother down the road. And uh, so the sheriff drives him into town, drops him off. Mac ends up staying at a hotel for three days with about 100 FBI agents looking for him. So Crawling with FBI. He gets away. And then, yeah, only FBI, and then gets away with it. And he's caught a week later. So imagine if we knew that um, Sheriff Cotton, who was the sheriff of Clark County, Washington, imagine if we knew that he gave a ride to D.B. Cooper. Uh, how insane yeah. would that be? Like, that's, that's wow. That's insane. And, yeah, it, it, and it'd, be like if we, it'd be like if we found out that D.B. Cooper stayed in the same hotel in Vancouver, Washington, as all the FBI agents, as him was and all those guys. Yeah. Yeah, what you look at it differently, but that that's that's true. It's fact in the case. In his case, didn't didn't the didn't the police officer ask him a question like something he should have known? Like, you know, like yeah, somebody was, about is, that lived further up the road, or he wasn't a local, but well, he answered no, it in a really was, smart way, didn't he? Yeah, it was clever. What it was is the sheriff asked him a basically. Max said he said where he said where where are you coming from? He said I was in I, I was in a fight down the road with you know, Bill Johnson, right? He, he, I mean, he just made up a name. And the sheriff to, was testing to see whether this was bullcrap or not. The sheriff goes, oh, yeah, Bill Johnson, he's got two kids, right? And a liar would agree with the sheriff, right, and go, oh, yeah, yeah. But Matt goes, oh, no, 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 Bill's got three kids, two, two, two daughters and a, and a son. And the sheriff goes, oh, well, maybe he's telling the truth. Let's yeah, that in, was right? smart. That, was, that shows yeah. you how smart he is. Quick. It was, Matt yeah. was very quick, you know, and uh, he got, I mean – you know, and Mac was planning to hijack a second plane, you know, um, 
when he got caught, he was like, I'm going to go hijack a million dollars this time. Cause he, he thought it was easy the first time. Yeah. Said, I'll do it again. <laughs> and one thing you found out is why he chose the airport he chose. And he, he said something, the security, he, he studied it and he said the security was lax, right? Uh, he tested, he drove to Chicago airport. O'Hare was too busy and O'Hare had metal detectors. He drove to Indianapolis, I think Cleveland, like even like Kansas City. Finally, St. Louis had no security. He's like, okay, this is where I'm doing it. And that's why he did it was because there was no metal detectors, you know, and it was just, which is crazy. And what's interesting too, is that the, for his first attempt, when he went down there to do his first attempt, he heard a voice, hey, Mac. He was like, oh my God, I'm caught. <laughs> but it was a buddy of his from the Navy who recognized him of all places, the St. Louis airport. So he had to abort his mission. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. You know, and that's why, and that's why it was, a small, was not local. It, it was a lot smaller world back then. It was, which is why I don't buy that Cooper was a local because. Right. right. It, 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 like when you were, you were with Marty, you were talking about uh, Kenny, Kenny Christensen. Of course, like why would the guy hijack his own airline and then walk through Portland international even though he was, you know, did these international routes mostly, but the odds of somebody just running into him were high. Yeah, very high. Hey, what are you doing standing in this? In uh, why are you standing? You know, in the in the in the terminal here. What are you doing? You know, hey, Kenny, what are you doing? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's stupid. That's why Kenny's a terrible suspect. I mean, if nothing yeah. else, you hijack a different airline. Even yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's just is insane because it's just, that's why Mac is such a great example of running into that guy, how he picked the airport, how he picked his name, uh the fact that he never jumped before, you know, because with Cooper, yeah. you don't know. I mean, there's you could make a good case for the fact he's never jumped at all or two, he's as good as Braden. I mean, that's that's yeah, one of the, it's the that, crazy what, things about I mean, the case. What, what, and other things that I have uncovered about Mac is that so Mac wore a suit. Mac was not a guy who normally wore a suit. But he, Did he wear a tie he, he too, wore, or just the or a coat? He wore a tie, wore a suit and tie, and he bought brand new shoes to, to, for the part. Brand new, like like nice shoes uh, from his dad. His dad's shoe store. His dad owned like McNally shoes in Detroit, but he bought yeah. shoes. Uh, he go. He goes. I bought these shoes uh, 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 with the family discount, by the way. <laughs> Let's throw that in there because it was his dad's store. Yeah, but, and uh, he was going to go for it at some point. He just it wasn't exciting enough to him. Yeah, but here's the thing about Mac, though. Mac wore um, blue jeans and a polo shirt under his suit. Okay? So when he sent, he just like just like Cooper, he sent his stewardess up to the front, said, hey, close the door, leave me alone. You know, when he did this, he took his clothes off and threw them out the back of the plane. And now he was, because he said, I didn't want to land on the ground dressed like the Skyjacker. I wanted it to look different, smart. And it makes you wonder if Cooper had the same thought, right? If Cooper was wearing something under his clothes, if Cooper landed with the suit on or not. Yeah. So, no, that, that brings me to this thing I was going to, I was going to ask you <laughs> because I know you, you posted this, <clears throat> you posted this in yeah, the I Facebook group, but I thought it was interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a, one of your other many skills is you're you're a master of Photoshop and anything related to it, yeah. making this great thing of Cooper. But it says, according to Tina, of course, Tina Muglow, he was actually wearing a brown suit with possibly a thin black stripe. Passenger Robert Gregory also noted that Cooper's suit wasn't black. He re he referred to it as a reddish brown suit with wide lapels. It's likely that the the reason so many witnesses claimed he was wearing a black suit is due to his black raincoat and top coat. Uh, that's great to dispel something like that because yes, there was some variation to it. Like, it, was it, you know, you had a black top coat, but it was a but gray underneath. Yeah, or brown. It's like people, yeah, brown underneath. Yeah, because see, and, and, and who else besides Tina would really notice that, right? And the thing, the thing about Tina, she never looked at him. She she said she, she, she. I mean, Tina is all in the FBI files saying I did not get a good look at Cooper because I didn't want to antagonize him by staring at. Him. You know, she kind that, of like yeah, averted her fascinating. eyes. Fascinating. Yeah, she said, "I never yeah. saw him." That that's why Florence Schaffner is the best witness for Cooper because she interacted with him when he was still a passenger before he became the hijacker and when he wasn't wearing his sunglasses. Uh, she interacted with him on eight occasions. I've counted eight different times she interacted with Cooper before he became the hijacker. Um, so she had the best look at him. Tina said, "Tina said, Tina said all I saw was a side profile briefly." 
But think about this. If Tina is sitting next to him for five hours or whatever, um, what is, I mean, she's going to be looking at something. She's probably looking at his pants. You know, she sees, she's going to see the detail in his suit better than other people would, right? Who are only yeah. glancing at the guy. Yeah. Um, and she's lighting yeah, his cigarette. So she's got to have something of his profile if she's trying to light his cigarette. Yeah. And, and, and so she would notice of all, I mean, the fact that she even said that it had a thin black stripe tells you that she was really observing, you know, it wasn't yeah. just old black or red, you know. Um, and Gregory, Gregory owned a paint store. He was a painter, like a, yeah. he was like so a he paint knew colors. Maker, paint maker. He knew colors really well. He was very, uh, um, very observant with colors. But yeah, Cooper wore a brown suit. People don't know that. And in fact, there's even a 302 that I came across just a few months ago. It's, it's in my book where uh, the FBI is like, we need to figure out whether he was wearing a brown suit or a black suit. You know, try to tr try to determine that. And they did determine he was wearing a brown suit. Um, but, but, but the black overcoat, of course, made him look like he's wearing black, right? Yeah. Because you're just, you know, I mean, from a distance, you're seeing that. And, that, and so that Cooper, for those who don't know, that's my sketch that I made. Um, I basically, ha having read through the FBI files, you learn a lot about what Cooper looked like beyond what the sketches show. Um, because part of the thing that they would do is they would, when the FBI would bring, um, they would bring tons of suspect photos to Tina or to Flo. And they would say, does this guy look like Cooper? Does he look like Cooper? Yada, yada, yada. And we have their responses. So like, for example, about McCoy, uh, Tina and Flo both say that Cooper's nose was narrower than McCoy's, okay? So we can we can know that his nose was narrower than McCoy's nose. Yeah, um, it's a baseline. Yeah, yeah, and so we have all these things, like his narrow face, Cooper had a narrow face. That comes up. Yeah, it wasn't round like Rekka's or, or square. It square, was square. more of an oval. A narrow, yeah, a triangular type shape. Um, you know, a triangular shape. And in fact, I mean, you know, Cooper's, you know, Cooper's head shape you know, if you look at that, uh, let me try to, I'll try to find that, you know, Cooper's head shape is really strange looking. Um, you know, I, I posted it, the, I posted it a while back. Here it is. So this is the head shape that, that Florence Schaffner picked out for Cooper. I mean, so that's, so Cooper's head shape. Oh, like wow. That. Yeah. That's really like a V, uh, you know, a V, a narrow shape. Yeah. So, so, so she saw hundreds of mug shots and that's the face that she picked out as, as, as his head shape. And so um, that, and I use that for my, for my personal sketch. Um, you know, so I made yeah, this. So that's your favorite, that one right there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I made that because it's, it's kind of a, you know, mixing of everything, you know, of things I've learned, so, you know. So that brings me to this, which is, um, this is of course, one of the 302s talking about Tina and yeah. here she's talking about uh, she's talking about the tie, uh, the head of hair. I might have put the wrong one up here, but it was. No, it's, it's at the bottom. I think says, I screwed it up, but I was, possibly. Oh no! This is why this is why I put this one up here. And I was going to ask you about that, so I was looking for a different one. But since I'm on this one, I was going to ask you about it. Yeah. It says uh, they're talking about the tie and the tie clip. Of course, uh, the tie bore the label Towncraft, the trademark of J.C. Penney Company. Tie clip were found on seat 18E and Stewart is Tina Mucklow after seeing the tie said it possibly belonged to the hijacker. Yeah. So, so is that just FBI, she never really thought about the tie because every, you know, this is the person that spent the most time with him, but is it because she was sitting next to him and kind of just focused on that and so couldn't possibly hundred percent say that was his tie. Okay. So the FBI, if they're not, if they're not for sure on something, uh, they're the, 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 so the FBI have very strict uh, way that they communicate. Okay, so like, they write in certain ways to be very they're very formulaic, and they'll use the term possibly if there's only one real witness to it. Okay, so for example, you know, um, for example, in the in the FBI profile, it says that Cooper's eyes are possibly brown because yeah. the only person who because only one person could attest Whoa. to that. That's Florence Schaffner, right? So, but, but Flo never said possibly. She said yes. Yeah, yeah. Especially she's in the I Saw brown. Mysteries, she's pretty confident in it. Oh, yeah. She is. She never deviated on brown eyes. But the FBI profile still says possibly because there's only one corroborating witness, right? So because Tina is the only person who they asked about, is this his tie? 
you know, um, then that's why. I, but she may have said possibly. But was Flo? Possibly, was there anything where Flo said that he was absolutely wearing this tie? No, because they didn't show it to Flo. Flo never saw that because see, this was shown to Tina in Reno. Like they got it off the plane and would have walked into the into the terminal where 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 Tina and all of them were being debriefed and said, "Hey, is this the tie?" you know, that Cooper was wearing or whatever, or the hijack was wearing. So, because see, Florence and Alice were still in Seattle, remember? They got off in Seattle. So, Florence Shaft yeah. never saw the tie. She was never presented with the tie. And only only Tina was shown the tie. So, that's why. And, then, and, and, and she said it was, yeah. So, she wasn't like. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, unless Cooper was sitting on the tie the whole time, because it was found in seat 18E. Um, yeah. It was and no tie. one else claimed it, but it was a cheap tie. So, I mean, no, and, and, and there's no passenger missing a tie. We have the video footage, right? The passengers. There's no, there's yeah. no you know, nobody's missing a tie. You know. But you, as a defense attorney, if you had to defend some guy that was being charged as being DB Cooper and one of the, and they, and they dragged the tie out, not just so, okay, let's just say some guy that worked at a factory, they'd find the, the uh, titanium and the antimony element or something like that, and you're actually gone to trial. Uh, wouldn't they bring up the they'd bring up the stews and say, do you even remember if he's wearing this? Can you say a, for a hundred percent certainty yeah. that this tie belonged to that passenger? One hundred percent. I mean, your job as a defense attorney is to sow reasonable doubt, right? You 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 we produce reasonable doubt because the thing about a jury is all it takes is one, right? In a criminal trial, all twelve have to be unanimous. So all it takes is one hardhead to help you out, right? And um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it would, yeah, th th that's what you would do is you would so down, you would say, Hey, you know, the tie, and that kind of gets into the cigarette butts too. It's like, right. You could, you could not, pro you could not prosecute Cooper today. In fact, it would be a mistrial from the beginning because of their negligence in destroying the cigarettes. Um, yeah. So I can't, I, I still they, can't believe they lost them. I mean, obviously there was no DNA them. back they, they lose shit. They didn't lose shit. They destroyed them. I mean, yeah, they intentionally. The they got rid of them. Yeah, intentionally. That makes me wonder. I know I'm a bit more of a conspiracy person than you are, <laughs> but I'm like, I can't believe they did that because let's just say they find a, a smoker of Raleigh filter tips that's a great suspect and they're trying to build a circumstantial case. And you're like, everybody we know says you're you're a heavy smoker of Raleigh filter tip cigarettes. And then time to bring them out. Well, we can't. We threw them away. Yeah, well, see, the thing about it is, is in today's – so. There is, I forget what the actual like rule is called in, in law, but so I used to be a prosecutor. I used to be, I used to be a district attorney for this one. Now, and I'm now a defense attorney. So I've done both sides. You have a, you have a duty as law enforcement to preserve all evidence in a case before, until it's resolved. Um, so what you would do, and if, 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 so for example, if evidence that could possibly be exculpatory evidence is lost or destroyed by law enforcement, then legally the judge has to communicate to the jury that you are to infer that whatever this missing evidence was would have been exculpatory. Okay. Like would have been. So for example, basically if, if you tried Cooper right now, the judge would have to direct the jury to, to say you have to believe that the, that these cigarettes would not have his DNA on them. Okay. So it has to be presented. Lost evidence has to be viewed in, 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 in an exculpatory light. So yeah, you'd have a mistrial because he, the jury would have to say, yep, it wasn't Braden's DNA or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. On there. So yeah. So it would be, it would be very easy to defend. Um, Cooper yeah. these days because you just get yeah. a different, and, and, and then also with the tie is the chain of custody. I mean, where was it? Was it always in, was it Seattle to Vegas to uh, they sent that Monaco thing or the, I, I, so in my book I have I about I think about four times. So it was okay. It was taken off the plane in Reno. Then it was taken to Vegas. Okay, they took it to a J.C. Penney in Vegas. And like handed it over to a clerk and said, "Hey, you know, do you sell these ties?" And the clerk wow, goes, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, and the clerk goes, "Yeah, we stopped selling these about a year and a half ago. These skinny, the skinny version of this, right?" Um, so then, 
uh, Vegas sends it to Seattle, okay? And then Seattle, for some reason, sends it to Portland, and Portland takes it to a local JCPenney and says, did you so sell it's been this to JC JCPenney's now? Yes, exactly. Then they send it back to Seattle, okay? Then Seattle, in 72, send it to Quantico, to the crime lab, to be tested for, for fibers and fingerprints and things, or fluids, body fluids. Um, because if they, because they could recover blood back then, or, yeah, or they, they, were, blood type. they had the ability. Yeah, they had the ability to tell blood type from. So if there had been blood on the tie, they could have, you know. So, but but the, but the crime lab says there's nothing on this tie. They send it back to the, back to Seattle. Then in '74, there's a suspect in LA who they're, they're particularly interested in, who I've never figured out who it is. I, I, I've tried, um, but they send the tie to LA. The LA agents put it on their desk for about four months. Four months later, from for, for when they receive it, they take it to the to the Holy ex wife. Cow. Yeah, they take the tie to the ex wife of this guy and say, "Hey, did he own this tie?" And she goes, "No, I've never seen that tie in my life." They go, "Okay, thank you." Then they send it back to Seattle, where it stayed until, I guess, two. I mean, until they send it. Then they send it. From 74, it sits in Seattle in a box. From 74 to 2000. Um, and then in 2001, they send it to back to Quantico for the DNA testing. Okay. And then they send it back to Seattle. So it, it made like cross country trips like crazy. They, just, the, they did the same thing with his hair too. They sent his hair in the regular mail back and forth. A bunch too. It was, a, it was the one hair. hair found on the back of the. I think that this talked about that too. Is it the one hair on the back of the seat? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, a limb hair and a head hair. They had two hairs. There's actually two hairs on, on the yeah, side. Yeah, was they removed from it. the back of the seat, allegedly used by the hijacker. An examination by the laboratory disclosed that it contained a head hair clipping and a brown limb hair. The head hair yeah. clipping is suitable for significant comparison. Yeah, so back. So the FBI had this thing called. Um, Basically, hair, hair micro hair compare comparative hair micro, microscopy, which was like where they would compare a suspect's hair with a hair found on a crime scene, right? Um, since then, it has been determined that that's like voodoo science. Um, they don't do that anymore, and a bunch of cases have been overturned because of faulty FBI. Anyway, so whenever they would get a suspect they liked, they would send a suspect's hair to Quantico. And Seattle would send Cooper's hair in a freaking envelope to Quantico and they'd compare it and then they'd send it back. And that hair slide's lost too. The last time we know the hair slide exists is in 1984. So the, the, the last time that we see the, the hair slide we... is in 84. Yeah. Wow. I mean, so the hair that slide is crazy. Yeah. The cigarette butts are destroyed for sure. We know that that, that is literally, they've that, that is in the FBI files. We destroyed them. Uh, which I asked Larry Carr. So Larry's so Larry's my good buddy now. So I asked, I texted Larry the other day. I said, "What did what did what did, what do you what would destroying the cigarettes mean? Because see, they destroy guns a certain way. I believe they melt guns. Yeah, um, yeah. drugs. They burn drugs. I mean, the, the, the he said, "Oh, they probably just threw that in the trash." <laughs> I was like, "Okay." So the cigarettes. It, yeah, Larry says, "Oh, destroyed in 1971 for cigarettes. They probably just threw it in the trash." You know. So I mean, I wonder if that would be, I mean, that was still evidence though. It was collected. And what was the reason it was to get rid of though. it? Yeah, well, they okay, did. So it was tested. So what they did is, is Vegas sent, so, so look, so Vegas was the, generally was the, the, the owner of physical evidence taken from the plane because it was their jurisdiction where the plane landed. Right. It was Reno, the Reno, yeah, Reno. Yeah. Vegas. Right. So, all of the physical evidence taken from the plane lived in Vegas. So the hair slide, uh, the cigarette butts, uh, his tie briefly, they, although his tie ended up in Seattle, but a lot of physical evidence was kept in, in Vegas. Um, Vegas sent the hair slide. I mean, Vegas sent the cigarettes to, to the crime lab in early December, 71 saying, wait, will you check these for fingerprints? Okay. And they checked it and they said, there's no fingerprints on here. Um, God, that's just amazing. So, like, if you ever get one, I mean, he's he's smoking it. I guess maybe like this or however. Yeah, and they det and it was them. It, so they determined it was so. So Tina didn't say it was Raleigh cigarettes. They determined it was Raleigh cigarettes 
by looking at the cigarette butts because I guess they have a marking on the filter, like right a stripe there. or something, or a... yeah. So that so, um, but yeah, they destroyed the cigarettes. They threw them in the trash, and the, now the hair slide is legitimately lost. And the FBI, I have filed a FOIA. Um, I know. I mean, the hair slide has a marking on it. It's like P P X eleven oh two or whatever. It's got some yeah. It's in one of those little things, the slides. little glass slide. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, and so the FBI, I filed a FOIA. I said, look, will you guys go look in your miscellaneous evidence, you know, where things were misplaced, right? So kind of like a lost and found, and they have one. And so uh, um, so they said they were going to look for it. I haven't heard back yet, but they they approved my FOIA to look to search the crime lab for DNA, for Cooper's uh, hair slide. So to me, that's the only, the only real hope of solving this case is finding the hair slide because – that's going wow. to be his DNA straight up. Yeah, it's got to be. So how did they know they, but they remember that they, 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 when they cataloged it, that it was Brown hair. Yeah, I guess when they looked at it, black, Brown, although what's interesting about Cooper's hair is that T, uh, Tina says Cooper had Brown hair. It's another, another kind of myth. Uh, Tina. So it could be dark her, Brown and dark Brown can look black, I guess, but black, yeah, you know. right. So, but, but that would be but, interesting yeah, if he's a brown here because if he was, you know, Native American or or, or like or full yeah, blood or something European or with swarthy skin, maybe you know the black hair would kind of back that up. Yeah, he had brown hair. She said he had dark brown hair. So, yeah. And, and again, hey, I trust Tina. She's she's next to the guy for hours. Right. So, and, and speaking of that, uh, and I wanted to find where she wrote it though, but. Where does the whole myth of the loafers come from? Because the only description I've ever seen of D.B. Cooper's footwear was from Tina, where she said uh, pebble grain, ankle high, uh, what, whatever. Yeah. I can't remember the, exactly what she ca called it, but that was the only description of the footwear, right? Yeah, let me find uh, in my book here. Uh, let me find, uh, let's see, his... Uh, I guess it's under physical appearance in my physical appearance chapter. I think I've got his uh, shoes in there. I think, yeah, his shoes. So I've got here, here we go. I'll just read this. This is from my book. It hasn't, hasn't come out yet. It says Cooper's shoes, contrary to popular belief are not loafers. The origin of this misconception is likely a widely distributed 1981 associated press article commemorating the 10th anniversary of the hijacking. The article's description of Cooper as wearing a business suit and loafers was repeated for the was repeated for the AP's 20th, 25th, and 30th anniversary articles. So, without access to the FBI files, widely spread articles such as these were unable to be fact checked, leading to the circulation of multiple misconceptions. So, basically, you know, when whenever someone would go write a, you know, an article about Cooper, right? You know, there weren't that many articles for them to use as sources. Well, a widely distributed AP article is a good source, mm -hmm. right? That's the AP. And so if the AP guy said it, it's also that same article, that same 1981 article is where we get the two um, drinks. Okay. That's the first, that's the only, that's the first time we hear that Cooper had two bourbon and sodas, right? Yeah. In actuality, he only had one and he spilled it. He spilled right? it. Yeah. According, yeah. That was uh, Bill Mitchell. Bill Mitchell. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah. So we know where these misconceptions come from. And like I said, they couldn't be fact-checked because the FBI weren't going to say anything, right? Um, they yeah. were holding a lot back. In fact, look, the FBI, the fact that Cooper left his tie on the plane was not known yeah. until 1989. You know, when... I mean, that uh, that McCoy, is crazy. Yeah, when the McCoy book came out, it was in the, it was in the McCoy book. Uh, Calame, the FBI agent, leaked, basically leaked that, that they had mm -hmm. the tie. You know, so yeah, so the tie was a the tie was a holdback. They did that on purpose because they wanted to be able to dispel any hoaxers by saying, "Okay, well, what did you leave on the plane, right?" And yeah, and Cooper would know. Oh shit, I left my tie. I mean, surely he knew that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, the one so they kept that quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Uncle Jim said Tina was a bad witness with too many contradictions, uh, though, and that does remind me of. The, but didn't but didn't Tina say early on? You know, didn't she? I don't know if she really necessarily changed something, but wasn't it that she was describing somebody that she did see maybe frontally? And you know, like you were saying earlier, she sat next to him, so she was getting a profile, but but never really was trying to look at him. You know, but no, but Tina some of her admitted. descriptions later on, 
and I think I don't remember somebody was saying, I don't know who it was, but that maybe she just got tired of it. You know what I mean? Like they showed her so many yeah. photos. She's just kind of like on autopilot, you know, no pun intended. Yeah. She is on autopilot because I mean, think about this. She she said that every single sketch looked like Cooper. OK, except for the hoodlum sketch where he looks kind of menacing looking. I call it the hoodlum. But literally every single sketch they showed to Tina, she goes, yeah, it looks just like him. It's like, but 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 the sketches are obviously very different people. Yeah, you know I mean, I mean, there's, I mean, I I, I can think of the four, the four. There's four main sketches, and all and all four are different human beings. Okay, they're just yeah, not totally the different. Thing. Like the, the the Florence chapter sketch from Unsolved Mysteries that they paid yeah, for. Yeah, that for one. Nothing like being. <laughs> well, the problem is 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 with is with the sketches is that. Um, we have Florence Schaffner. So we, we have Florence Schaffner and Unsolved Mysteries being a bit dramatic, saying, oh, I still remember his face every day, yada, yada. I know yeah. exactly what it was like. Well, we have the FBI files. We have Florence Schaffner in 1976 saying, saying, you guys need to stop showing me pictures, pictures of suspects because I don't remember what, I don't remember what he looked like anymore. So, and now Tina says that in 1972 in, in, Let's see, September of 72, so not even a year after the hijacking, Tina says he's becoming foggy in her mind. Yeah, she says she's been an unreliable says, witness at that point. Like if yeah, they ever she found says somebody that she, that... she says that she has seen the Cooper sketch so many times. She's talking about the Bing sketch. She says she's afraid that the sketch is starting to take over her mem her actual memory. And oh yeah. Have, As a defense you know, attorney, you'd have a field day with that. I mean yeah, and, and and that is something that's in the FBI files where they're like, look, the witnesses are no longer any use. If Florence Schaffner can't remember what it looked like, nobody else can, you know. So and she and basically they say we can tell that basically there's all the witnesses are just thinking of the sketch in their mind at this point. When they're comparing yeah. our suspects to Cooper, they're just thinking of the sketch in their yeah. brain. Didn't Bill Mitchell say that about Osmosis. McCoy? Didn't Bill Mitchell say that about McCoy or something? Or I thought no. Well, no. I mean, they about McCoy is everybody. Everybody said that McCoy was not Cooper. I mean, so I mean, they did. Yeah, actually, you know, no. There, there is a witness. Their name is redacted. And maybe it is Bill. There, yeah, it might be Bill. There is, there is one witness who, when they show him McCoy's picture, says, "Well, that guy kind of does look like the sketch, but it's not Cooper." So yeah, not the same guy. So. I mean, literally every single word, every single one of them. I mean, look, the thing about McCoy, all 10 witnesses said it wasn't Cooper. I mean, that he yeah, wasn't Cooper. Yeah. All of them. And McCoy's on TV a lot, too. McCoy was a big hijacking because they captured the guy, right? You know, you would think that Florence watching TV would go, oh, there's Cooper, you know? Oh, my yeah. God, I never thought I'd see him again, you know? Because that was but, like five months, five months after the Cooper hijacking the mccoy does his and that's you know it wasn't like this long long period before no they looked no. at you know and, they and, it still was in their mind i mean yeah and they said i mean for one thing they said that um basically when, when it came to mccoy um you know uh let's see let, let, me, let me look at this real quick let me pull up this thing uh for mccoy uh when they saw the, the pictures of mccoy um Let's see. This is what uh, this is what they said. Let me find it. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is this is from my book again. I'm reading. The three stewardesses even provided some insight into Cooper's appearance during this presentation of the McCoy photographs. They noted that Cooper had fuller hair than McCoy's thin comb over, and it was also pointed out that Cooper's nose wasn't as wide as McCoy's. Finally, Florence Schaffner observed that McCoy had blue eyes whereas the eyes that she had stared into on that November afternoon were definitely brown, according to her. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they were, I mean, it, it, the, all of them were certain, definitely not identical. It says, Bill, it says witness, witness Bill Mitchell, who was reached by agents while attending classes at the University of Oregon, stated that McCoy was, quote, definitely not identical to Cooper. So, wow. I mean, that's just the nail in the coffin. I mean, like, there's so many of them, but... Oh, it's, uh, it should be, yeah. You know, and it's like Marty said on that uh, Facebook chat you did yesterday. Would if you, outside of everything that's against McCoy, which is a lot, if you really drilled down on where he was and where he wasn't, it, 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 it he didn't have time to come back to to go, you know, come from 
Um, Not really. You know, if he jumps out around uh, Portland to get back to uh, Provo, sixteen hour or, drive. Yeah, like yeah. it's just the, the numbers be, don't the numbers don't work. No, he has to be back on his couch by ten a.m. the next morning. Yeah, I mean, you know, just, I don't. That's not literally not possible, actually, unless he flew. You can't yeah. go from basically a perfect drive on today's interstate from Portland to Salt Lake City or to Provo uh, is sixteen hours. So, and back then they didn't drive as yeah. fast. And, the and, why, and, and, and who's going to like take another plane? I mean, if he's bruised, he's banged up. Plus, he's got to get out of wherever he jumped, wherever people think yeah. the drop zone is. And he has he's, no got, he's got a long him. hike ahead of him, no matter where he lands. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's 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 mind numbing. The McCoy grift is just it's a headache. You know? <laughs> the grider yeah, grift. I, I mean, and the thing is, grider. No, I I don't. It's like grider isn't stupid. Okay, Dan Ryder's not a dumb individual. He just isn't. And, and it makes you wonder, it's like, what are you doing? Like, he, it's almost like, so, it, you know, there is the, it's, it's called the sunken cost fallacy, where basically, you know, you have put so much into something, you can't come back. Yeah. And it's almost like Grider has, he, he can't admit he's wrong. And he's wrong. Yeah, he can't. That's why he, he pushed it further with the parachute which nobody in their right mind thought D.B. Cooper was going to actually keep the parachute. Like, oh, I need it for a keepsake. <laughs> Who's going to keep no. that massive thing? You're just going to bury it, you know? Uh, yeah. Why, I mean, why, I, you don't want to get caught with it. Uh, of course, the, the the famous one he found in the McCoy barn somewhere in North Carolina had the uh, the D-rings on it, which we know didn't. For a fact, we know Cooper's parachute right. didn't have the D-rings, which yes. you attach the reserve to. So, yeah, and he felt that. Wait, and for those who were uh, – here's a sidebar about, about Mac. When Mac woke up from his concussion sleep, uh, he took a dump in, in a parachute and stepped on it. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, because he wanted <laughs> whatever FBI – That's how Mac. Yeah, well, well, he knew the FBI would eventually find it and go, oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah it was a calling card. Um, he was mad, though, because he said, you know, at my trial, they never mentioned it, and I was disappointed that they never mentioned that they found shit in my – parachute yeah so he was disappointed yeah i mean i think with grider like every youtube video that even hints of db cooper it even mentions db cooper you've got like eight people oh this guy already solved it on youtube or whatever and i engaged with these people a couple of times eventually you just give up but uh then i would see that they would just delete all their comments like it, it's like he's got he's got like he's got a call center or somebody <laughs> you know like every time a Cooper <laughs> video pops up there'll probably be some on this one you know like no it was a mccoy man greater solve this why can't you guys leave it alone and accept it man yeah i mean look and, and that's why in my db cooper book i have an entire chapter devoted to mccoy because i'm i'm sick of this and it needs to die you know <laughs> and um you know and, and i mean you know the problem is is i i think that i, I what i think did it is if you watch the unsolved mysteries episode which is the most that is the most watched db cooper thing of all no time. doubt yeah oh, more than in time. search of yeah it's not even close i mean because I mean, that thing was syndicated still is oh yeah it was I mean, huge yeah it, it, i mean it's i mean you know it was it's it was i mean unsolved mysteries episodes were as ubiquitous as like saved by the bell episodes right just oh absolutely That's why they were TV. catching all these people because so many people were watching it at once because yeah. we didn't have youtube show. back then yeah, yeah. and yeah, that's why as soon as somebody yeah, yeah, popped up on TV. there, oh, we found the guy. You know, there'd be update yeah. five minutes ago. We found a guy in Poughkeepsie. Well, and, and so what's interesting about McCoy is that in the Unsolved Mysteries episode, they have a brief, like, cutaway where they play the creepy Unsolved Mysteries music and you hear Robert Stack saying, Richard McCoy was caught four months later. Was he Cooper? You know, and it has, like, his mm -hmm. sketch next to his photograph. And it looks... I mean, if you didn't know better, you go, oh, God damn, that's the same guy. <laughs> you know, without mentioning that three, with, without mentioning that four other guys also jumped out of airplanes, right? With, with money. Yeah. You know, they don't yeah. mention that. So it, it makes it, 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 narr it, when you only mention McCoy as, as the only copycat, you go, well, maybe it is the same guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, it, so that creepy music along with Stack saying Richard McCoy was, you know, you know was found five yeah, later, you, That's what you're not does question it. it. Yeah, it sounds good. You no, know, yeah, I mean, I mean, that is what. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but 
they actually did, the FBI didn't spend much time on McCoy. And what's funny is, if you remember, I sent this to you recently, a while back, where, um, and I think it's in my McCoy chapter here at the end, where basically they were making fun of, so when Russell Calame, who was an FBI agent out of Salt Lake City, when he wrote the real McCoy book in the late 80s, saying that McCoy was Cooper, we actually have a 302 um, of, uh, of FBI agents mocking him, saying, can you believe that Calame just wrote a book saying that McCoy was Cooper? That is ridiculous. What a joke. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't better. know that. Yeah, that, that's good yeah, stuff. They're like, yeah, they're like, he knows better, you know, um, than this. I mean, yeah, they're, they're basically like bitching at Calame saying this is ir irresponsible because it's, it's not Cooper, you know. And then we have a 302 where Karen McCoy was being harassed, harassed by Russell Calame. And she's like, I told him to leave me alone. That yeah, my husband. That she sued. That was before she sued, right? Before she sued, and she said, "Look, because the FBI was starting to call her, saying, hey, was 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 your husband Cooper?'" And she hung up on him. She said, "Look, it's not my problem that you guys can't solve a a, a twenty five year old hijacking, you know, or whatever." And she hung up. You know, she said, "Leave me alone. I, my husband, my husband was not Cooper. You know, my husband was who he was." You know, he was a hijacker, but he wasn't Cooper. And you know, the sad thing about McCoy, it, it's almost heartbreaking, really, because McCoy got out of, he, he escaped from prison because he thought he was never going to see his kids again. Okay. He was given a 45 year old sentence. He was given a 45 year sentence. His kids were, I think, uh, sh uh, sh I think Shanti was four. And I think yeah. Rick, and Rick, Richard Jr. Hungry, yeah, Rick, he was like yeah. one. Yeah, mm -hmm. Rick, uh, little Rick was like yeah. one, and I and I gotta watch what I say about Rick because you know Rick is an MMA instructor in Virginia. He'd come kick my ass. Right? Yeah, he's in Richmond. Um, yeah, I a, think his daughter a was a, was a MMA fighter for a while. Yeah, Rick's yeah, daughter. right. So, yep. So, but anyway, so um, he never he, he thought he'd never see his kids again, right? And so he broke out of prison just to he's just he's like you know I, I gotta see my kids. The sad reality is none of these hijackers served more than. A few years, Mac, Mac served thirty-eight years because he kept trying to break out of prison, you know. Yeah, and that's, they, that's on. the one thing you don't do. Yeah, they kept like saying, "Well, you keep breaking out. We're going to keep," you know. Whereas um, Rob Heady and Lapointe, who were suffering from PTSD from Vietnam, they had both been actively in combat in Vietnam, same as McCoy. Um, if you remember, in the late seventies, Jim, you know, the the Jimmy Carter administration began to forgive all the draft dodgers, right? You know, they began to like. They had a very like lean, they started like revisiting all of the Vietnam guys who were messed up, right? And part of their effort in the late 70s was to forgive these hijackers because it was so such a common thing for these for these veterans um to yeah. um to do they were, this. Yeah, they were understanding they were yeah, had PTSD, they were they were yeah. Wanted that yet, but. Right, right. And so uh LaPointe and Heaty were out in six years, okay. And uh, there's no reason to think McCoy wouldn't have been given the same treatment, you know, so he would have been out. So honestly, McCoy would be yeah, 80 years sad. old right now. Yeah, you're right. So That's could be, I, mean, I mean, we could be talking to Richard McCoy at CooperCon in, a month from yeah. in, next month and not McNally. Um, it's really tragic, really, you know, um, that if he had just if he had known that, then he would have just, he would have just stayed put, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it, it's, really sad. it's tragic. It, yeah, I mean, Mac, it, it is. And I mean, he was. He basically committed suicide by cop. Um, oh yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, he knew the FBI were in there. You don't survive gun battles with the FBI. Um, and he told he told his uh, his partner there, uh, I forget his name, uh, but uh, he told his partner said, "Look, if, if we're ever caught, I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna get in a gunfight and die." And his yeah. partner said, "Well, I'm just gonna surrender. Screw that." <laughs> I don't yeah. want to die, but McCoy was willing. McCoy was always suicidal, though. He had suicidal tendencies his whole life, apparently. Um, it, I mean, his psychological profile that's in the FBI files, talk, he talks a lot about his suicidal thoughts. Wow, that I didn't had, know that. Even in Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, had, he, had, he, struggled, he had struggles with depression, and um, possibly this is why he was so reckless as a soldier uh, in Vietnam, because he would literally – jump into his helicopter by himself and just without his good door gunner or anything, just take off and go try to rescue people and, 
I mean, he was a real badass guy. Oh, he was. But, yeah, I told you I was talking to that yeah. guy that knew him. Uh, Norman Ben Dixon, oh, yeah. I think I'm saying that right. Knew him, which in uh, his first, McCoy's first tour is a Green Beret uh, in 64. Yeah. You know, and he, you know, I asked him, I told you, like, uh, do you ever remember him smoking over there? Because if you're going to, if you're going to be a closet smoker or you're a Jack Mormon, as they call him, of course, McCoy was Mormon, didn't smoke, didn't drink, right. but he, uh, you'd do it in Vietnam, you know. Sure. I mean, if, if, if anybody's oh, going to yeah. rattle on you. And he said, no, guy was a strict Mormon. He didn't touch cigarettes. No, or drink. Yeah, or, or drink. Or drink. Yeah. You know. And, 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 and something else I found out when I was writing my book about this and I was doing my, doing my McCoy chapter was that McCoy, of course, he had a lisp, right? He had a, he had a speech impediment. Yeah. Um, that yeah. Basically, that, he had the skin surgery. under his tongue was, was, was removed because it was too bad, so they yes. removed it. It caused a lisp, permanent lisp, and also his voice was very high pitched. He had a weird, he had a very nasally high pitched voice, and in fact, his voice was so strange that we have the three hundred twos of his flight crew who were, you know, after they get after they get off the plane, right? We have their three hundred twos, and uh, the co-pilot says, "I think that the co-pilot says his voice was very strange, and I think he may have been disguising his voice, like he thought oh, he thought wow. McCoy was like." putting on a fake voice, right? But that was just mm -hmm. really his voice. Whereas Cooper's, of course, voice is no accent at all, low, flap, just generic. Yeah, low, yeah. I mean, it's just very normal. generic, possibly Western, Midwestern, no accent. And, you know, flight attendants are probably pretty good at picking up accents, I would think. You know, and yeah, I mean, no, that, that's not true, Uncle Jim. No, that's not. I true. think he was McCoy armed, was but, but wasn't he? Wasn't he killed with some that guy? The the man that shot him wasn't it his personal shotgun? It was. Like, wasn't uh, Nick O'Hara. Yeah, yeah, Nick O'Hara yeah. shot him with his own personal shotgun, which is a massive, massive no-no. No-no. I mean, like, no-no, because you have to be able to trace shell casings and you know, for legal purposes, it just yeah, blew him like away. FBI issued ammo. FBI issued weapon. Yeah, and so he, I mean, he was a gun, you know, like it was personal. Yeah, and he wasn't executed. I mean, he died of a sin. I mean, we have the photo of McCoy dead on the slab. We have his dead body laying. There's a photo of him dead. He has a giant shotgun wound on his chest. I mean, he was hit one time with buckshot, you know, from ten feet away, um, because they told him they said, "Hey, hey, we're, hey, we're, hey," they said FBI, and he raised his gun and they shot him. I mean, um, but he had, like I said, he had these suicidal tendencies. Uh, and there's actually a photo of him in his coffin, too, holding a Book of Mormon, which is cool. He's wearing his military. He was buried oh. in his military uniform. Yeah, it, opened, it was open casket. Yeah, he was buried in his, yeah. his, his uh, uniform from Vietnam. Holding a Book of Mormon, which is yeah. pretty cool, I think. <laughs> yeah, that, that's insane. So, you know, going back to the show you did with Marty is you think Cooper had was mentally ill. I mean, yeah. Is that just come from reading the files? Because you've read more than anyone. Uh, where are you are, are you thinking it just because it was so crazy, or where do you where do you arrive at that? I know nothing's hard and fast, but but where sure. do you arrive at the fact that, that you think he was could have been mentally ill, like McCoy? Yeah, I don't know any because I don't know any hijackers. Having studied, I mean, having been immersed in the world of because I'm, I'm I, I mean. I'm writing two books concurrently. I'm writing a copycat book on Cooper and I'm writing this FBI files book on Cooper and really immersing yourself in the skyjackers of that era. All of them have mental illness. I mean, there's literally not a single one because you wouldn't do this if, I mean, because your, your odds of, your odds of success are so low in a skyjacking. It, it's so dramatically low that, um, I mean, this is a death penalty case, right? So, I mean, but his behavior, it, it's weird. I, I mean, the problem, here's the problem with Cooper, though, Drew, is that is he the anomaly, right? Is he special? Yeah, yeah, because, you know, the, the copycats got yeah. caught. Right, and Cooper didn't. Now, but, but, but do you give extra credit? But, but was he not caught because he was the first, right? You know, you get, you, you get a lot of points for being the first to do something, right? He didn't. You know, the you know Cooper didn't know. I mean, the FBI didn't know what the pressure bump meant, right? If they had known that that pressure bump was him jumping, they would have closed off Clark County immediately, right? 
Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. when they Close learned, the when they, yeah, when they learned that the pressure bump, like when they learned that that was Cooper jumping, all subsequent copycat hijackings, the FBI told the flight crew, hey, you're going to feel the stairs are going to close when he jumps. Let us know. And sure enough, it, Mac, the point, McCoy, Heaty, Heineman, when they jumped, the crew called in and said, hey, he just jumped. So they, th that's how they know exactly where these guys jumped. They didn't, Cooper got the benefit there. You know, but for those who don't know, mm -hmm. there was not a single boot. No, there was no law enforcement on the ground for 36 hours in, in his, in the, in the original drop zone. And the drop zone now is a little lower, but in the, in the original yeah, drop zone, so 36 the hours. At the center. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was the, it was the center drop zone, but he, but yeah, he, Cooper could have crawled out of there. I mean, look, you give a bank robber a 36 hour head start. You're never going to find him. He's gone. Oh yeah. They're gone. Yeah. 36 hours. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it wasn't it, as remote it, it, it as was. people think, you know, I know Darren says that all no. the time, by the way, Darren said he was, he'd be watching tonight. So shout out to Darren Schaefer, our good friend. No, 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 it's, uh, it's but Darren was from the area and he said, it's not near as dense as people made it out to be. Yeah. No, you know, not as far as the, I mean, the conditions. No. And here's the thing too. Cooper jumped into a County with a 1970 population of 200,000 people. That's not the, the Yukon. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. he was as likely to land in somebody's backyard as he was in, in a forest. Right. There was houses. There were, I mean, it wasn't a subdivision yeah. by any means, but it wasn't this, you know, it wasn't this no, it was, dense forest Amazon. No. And I think, and, and, and here's something we can learn from Mac is talking to somebody who winged his jump, who winged his drop zone, same as Cooper. What Mac did is Mac said he looked around and saw that there was civilization down there. Right, but not too much, okay? Because you don't want to be out in the boonies because you will get lost in the woods at night and you're screwed. But you don't want to be, but, but, but you don't want to jump over downtown Vancouver, Washington, and land on and land on a cop car at a four-way yeah. stop. You <laughs> yeah, know exactly. So, so what? So, uh, so what? And, and here's what's fascinating too. So I met, I mean, I've talked to him on the phone. So Jim McClellan is a, is a name, is, is this guy's name. So. If anybody who's familiar with the Rackstraw Grift knows that there was a small plane flying in the air around that night, flying in the area the day before, you know, just doing circles and things like this. Well, I've talked to that pilot. He's still alive. He's in his mid. He was younger. He was like 25 years old at the time. His family, but well, his it was his airstrip. It's called the. It's still there. It's the McClellan Air McClellan Airstrip. It was in his front yard. Yes, the private airfield. Yes. That was his private place, and he had went to go buy an airplane and was circling that night. Basically, he told his wife, hey, turn the headlights on of your car so I can land on our strip, you know? Mm -hmm. So he's circling, waiting for his wife to turn the headlights on so he can land, because there were no lights on his air, on his airstrip. So he landed with, you know, so everyone who's talking about, you know, this plane, it, it was this guy's plane. And the FBI interviewed him, damn near busted down his door. Because think about this, the FBI's first drop zone, and this is fact, this is this is hard, hard fact. Literally, Cooper, their, their drop zone, Northwest Airlines drop zone by Paul Soderlund, has him landing on McClellan's property. Literally. Wow. He's li literally, it's on his property, is where the epicenter of the drop zone is. So they really were like, you son of a bitch, must have been you. His wife, he said his <laughs> wife called him. Get out. He was, uh, uh, he, was an, he was an engineer in Vancouver and like he used to like fly to Vancouver every day and like you know just because it's because his office was next to his little was next to an airstrip in Vancouver so it take five minutes you know you know, skip the traffic you know take a flight anyway she, she said the FBI is here the FBI was like jimmying their trunks open without permission um they were all over the place I mean they demanded to see a photograph of him they said show us your wedding photo and she was like here you go you know and Wow, and they and she, and she never got it back. Like they took his like wedding photo, and like never gave it back. Um, so, but anyway, I talked <laughs> to this guy, and, and, and the cool thing about him is he was flying in that in the at the you know in that era, right? So I was able to yeah. ask him if you're at ten thousand feet with a triple cloud cover, could from from the center where you're where he's from, could you see the lights of Portland and Vancouver? From 10,000 feet in, in the clouds, he said no. 
not from the center. He said, he said the first, wow. he said you would first. Or the late Merwin Downs. No. Yeah. He said, he said you would first start to see the lights of Vancouver and Portland. Cause it's just, cause you know, Vancouver and Portland, it's one city. It's a glob. So it'd be just one mass of light. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he said he didn't yeah, see yeah. Portland just runs into Vancouver. Yeah. It's the same city essentially. But he said that you would not see that until battleground. Okay. Which is where a lot of us modern people think he jumped. Okay. Modern slip is where I think he jumped in between battleground and orchards. Okay. So he said, yeah. he told me this guy who said, he said in 1971, you know, and, and he said, if you're flying above the center, you could not see the center. Because it wasn't enough light pollution, right, to see it from the clouds. Yeah, the center is a little bitty nothing. Yeah, and, and he dispelled the uh, in search of myth about the Lake Merwin lights. Remember how in in search yeah. of it says the yeah right flood lights were. He goes, no way. He, I told him, I told him that. He goes, who said that? I said the TV said that. He goes, well, that's know, uh, Mr. Like, Spock, dude, don't don't yeah, argue. No, he, Mr. Goes, Spock. he goes, no, he goes, that's not true. He goes, I you know Lake Merwin's two miles from his house. He goes, I can't see the dam at night. It, it's, it's there's no, I mean, and, and, you know, there's not enough lights to see the dam. That's a total myth about the lights. So, yeah, think about this. If you're DB Cooper, he's dead reckoning. We're nearing, we're nearing Portland soon, right? He knows it's about 35 minutes from Seattle to Portland. If he can't jump outside, if he doesn't jump outside Seattle, he has to wait until roughly near Portland because there, it's just woods in between Seattle and Portland. It's just, that's just wilderness. That is the true wilderness. Okay. You don't start getting real civilization until battleground orchards, then Vancouver, Portland. So think about this. He's like, okay, if I'm going to jump near Portland, back where I started, which makes sense to me, because that's where his transportation probably was, right? Somewhere in Portland. Yep. Is he, goes, he's, so, he, so I, I have him. Oh yeah. Uh, Mac had goggles in his mystery bag. So I have picture Cooper looking outside waiting until he sees Portland and Vancouver in the distance, right? Then looking down and seeing that there is some civilization down there. So I'm going to jump in a sweet spot. I don't want to jump over the city because I'll be caught, you know, and no, I don't want to jump over the freeway or, or, or water or water or water. Yeah. There's a river. There's a mile wide river down there, right? That's dangerous. Yeah. Um, Columbia. So, so I think he jumped where he, in that sweet spot, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, by, by, by dead reckoning. Be a good place dead to do reckoning. It. Yeah. And he said, okay, because yeah. I mean, you can see Vancouver and Portland. I mean, there, 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 I mean, there are no other huge cities around there, right? So he saw in the distance and said, I'm not going to jump. I'm not going to. And like I said, I've talked to the guy who was there in 71. He said, in 71, you would not see Vancouver, Portland in the clouds at 10,000 feet until you, got to, until you got to Battleground. And I think that's an interesting clue. Yeah. So how far is Battleground from Ariel? It's not uh, like about 10 miles or is it 12, not that far? 10, 10 or 12 miles, yeah. Okay. So I, pretty I far so. off. I mean. Well, okay. So the so here, I, let me explain this to your viewers, okay? The reason why the FBI screwed up on the flight, on the, not the, not the, the flight path is correct. The drop is the problem. It's where along the flight path he jumped. What time? Here's the problem with the FBI is so the first indication that something was amiss, okay, is we have um, we have the so there is a gauge on the 727 called the rate the cabin rate of climb the cabin rate of climb indicator. It sat right in front of Harold Anderson's flight engineer panel, and any any time the pitch of a plane changes ever so slightly, this gauge kind of moves around, okay. And Anderson saw, they didn't feel it. They didn't feel anything because it's a big plane. He saw his gauge moving and he goes, hey, look, he goes, hey, 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 guys, look at this. And uh, it's funny because uh, Radicek turns because Anderson is right behind Radicek, co pilot. Radicek turns to, to look at it. And when he does, his earpiece pops out. And that's actually in the transcript. He goes, oh, 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 he goes, uh, my earpiece popped out. He goes, uh, we're experiencing oscillations in the cabin. Now he's he, that's Radicek telling the flight, telling the ground control. We have that in the transcript. Him saying I, I, we're having oscillations, looking at the thing. Right, that was at eight eleven p.m. when the oscillations happened. Okay, but talking to Radicek 
and talking to Anderson, they said they discussed the oscillations. They watched the gauge move around. And what that is, is that was Cooper on the stairs. Because when Cooper's on the stairs, yeah. it's causing some pitch problems with the plane. But not enough to feel it, but enough to see it on the gauge. So he, the Radicek and, and Anderson mm-hmm. said that we discussed it for a few minutes. Then we, we then we felt the so Cooper was standing the on the on the on the aft staircase for a while. For a so couple he's minutes. standing on it for a for minutes. how long before he jumps? Two or three minutes. Two or three minutes, and that's what I that's why I'm thinking he's looking around the front of the plane, right? Because it's not the back, right? He's looking out. The, he's looking forward, you know, in, into the wind, mind you. But if he has goggles on, it's not gonna be okay. And then he jumps. The problem is, the FBI for some reason. They, but well, it wasn't the FBI. It was Northwest Airlines. So people, people give people tend to diss on the FBI. The FBI didn't know about airplanes. They didn't know about parachutes. They had to like outsource this stuff. So they outsourced the drop zone. They outsourced the drop zone to uh, Northwest Airlines. A legendary pilot named Paul Soderlund. He's in the Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, it, uh, Paul Soderlund was a genius pilot. One of the, one of the greatest who ever who's ever lived. I mean, legitimately. Okay. But Paul Soderlund made a mistake. He conflated he conflated oscillations and pressure bump. Remember, these are two different things, right? Oscillations, 811, pressure bump, two or three minutes later. Okay. He conflated it. So all of their all of their drop zone calculations were based on 811 jump, right? Because of reality, that screw up. Yeah, when in reality it's 813, 814, two or three minutes later. Okay. Well, Which when you're them, flying it, can, you know, how many air miles you know further away yeah, from the original it, drop yeah, zone. Yeah, I mean, you're, it, when you're flying three miles a minute, every minute matters, right? So when so so yeah, oh yeah, so especially so at you know, ten thousand feet. Yeah, so like you know, the aerial Lake Merwin aerial. DB DB Cooper days, you know, all that type of stuff was a mistake. That's why they found nothing. So the army, the army <laughs> search, the FBI search was all about 10 miles north of where he actually jumped. And it's like, and, and, and here's my problem with what Eric is doing. Wow. Okay. Oh. The, the, the issue with the issue with the issue with what Eric Ulis is doing, my concern, again, Eric's a friend of mine. I'm not going to speak ill of him, but the issue with when he's making these alternate flight path things. And he's saying that Cooper jumped near Tina Bar, which is again is ten miles west of the flight path. There is no chance at all that Cooper landed near Tina Bar. Like just none, literally none, zero, zero, yeah, beyond zero. Twenty-three. Chance. It's impossible. Yeah, I mean, again, because of the, because of the sage yeah. radar, there's there's nothing yeah, I mean, showing that it went near over the Tina. It's impossible. It's literally impossible. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, folks don't understand that pilots don't just fly in the air. They follow highways just like we do on the ground. You know, they're called ve- Vector Airways. They were yeah, driving Victor, down the Victor center 23 of the goes a, is a corridor. They call it a corridor. Right, right. So they weren't 10 miles, you know, off. They, they weren't drunk driving 10 miles off course, right? They weren't off-roading, essentially. Anyway, the problem is when Eric's like, I believe the parachute is around here. I believe Cooper buried, he buried his chute around here. All this type of stuff. The problem with that is, is that everyone who lives in Clark County, Washington, they all believe that Cooper jumped up near Aerie because that's what there's DB Cooper days. That's where, you know, TV says, you know, Ariel, Ariel's the DB Cooper. They were place, told. Right? Lake Merwin, you know, right. That's what they're told. And now they see Eric Ewis saying, oh, actually, it was near Tina Bar. Well, the people who actually live where Cooper jumped have never heard, they have no idea. The people who live between Battleground and Orchards, Washington have no idea. None of them. I guarantee you, not, not a single, because like, there's like, 15 people in the world who are nerdy enough like us to know this, right? Nobody in that area has ever gone in there like in the woods behind their house looking for Cooper's parachute because they never thought about it, right? So when Eric does this stuff about this kind of misinformation mm-hmm. about where Cooper's jump is, it doesn't help, right? If Eric would if Eric if Eric would use his media personality, and he's a good Eric is a, the, the, I mean look, look, the media loves Eric. I mean Eric was on Jake Tapper this week. Right. Oh yeah, I mean he he, he, get, he can get on CNN. I mean he was on CNN the other day, uh, yeah. you know. CNN, I'm headline news. I mean he was on he was he was interviewed by Jake Tapper on CNN. Yeah, it was on Yahoo. It just popped up on the 
screen. Yeah. I work with my so uncle, he and he had this big his... screen behind him at his desk, and I see Euless's face. I'm like, you know. Oh, my God. There's Eric. Yeah. I mean, so if he used his power for good, as I say, right, and then then if he put that effort into the real drop zone, then maybe we would find Cooper's parachute stashed somewhere, you know, because – like, like you said, there's no reason to bring his parachute. They're heavy as hell, for one thing. Yeah, and well, no reason. No one's going to keep that for a souvenir. I mean, that's ridiculous. No. I mean, you, it's not, no, and, and, you got the, if you got any of the money, there's your souvenir. Yeah, I mean, there are no paratroopers on D-Day who are like, let me just take this with me, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, or, that's a point. I, I mean, Ted Braden, when when Ted and Hetrick and those guys land, they're not carrying their parachutes around. They're just... They buried them, remember, because they didn't want them to be found. Yeah, you they ditched them. Oh, and they yeah, especially jumping them. into Laos. So you don't, you don't, you wanted to get rid of any, any, anything no, that they could track it, you with. There's just no reason. I mean, just no reason to do that. So, but yeah, so that is it, that we know that now, and that is why Larry, you know, the FBI now, Larry Carr, uh, and then e, Curtis Ng after him, the current FBI drop zone is battleground to orchards. So I mean, they they have officially revised that. Um, so Cooper did not jump near Ariel. And it's kind of sad because when you read the FBI files, they keep finding nothing in the drop zone. And they keep like twice, two different times, they go back to the Air Force saying, are you guys sure that y'all did this right? Because we can't find a damn thing here, you know, and we think we'd find something. And but they just never realize. And what's sad about it is, is I called John Detler. I've spoken to John Detler several times. John Detler was one of the very first Norjack case agents. There were three Norjack case agents, guys named Charlie Farrell, John Steele, John Detler. They were the very first case agents in 71. It was John Detler's case from 71 to like 74. Okay, so he is one of the original guys. He was, John Detler was yeah. on the sled test. John Detler was with the army going through the woods in March of 72. He was, he was there, he was the guy, right? He was the man. Um, anyway, well, I told John all this on the phone about the mistake of the dz and he was just aghast he that's like, huge oh it's, it's like that, that's the biggest thing that's come out since yeah. the money finds he's, he's like we wasted so much effort on Ariel, and if we had known and he goes that makes perfect sense but here's the thing john Detler was a lawyer so remember back then fba agents were lawyers and accountants right i mean that's what jager hoover wanted lawyers and accountants in fact <laughs> charlie farrell was a lawyer uh, John Detler was a lawyer. Some of the very, almost a, 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 a J. Earl Milne, who was the special agent in charge of the Seattle office at the time. Uh, he was a lawyer. They're all lawyers. They don't know anything about parachutes or about aviation. I mean, they learn about bank robberies. That's their wheelhouse, right? The FBI is good at bank robberies, not this thing. You know, I mean, yeah. this was totally out of their, you know, it's like the packing cards thing. It's like, you know, they didn't know that there shouldn't be two packing cards and a parachute. So like they never knew that they had DB Cooper's packing card, as we've discussed. And they just yeah. never knew that because I mean, John Detler himself, poor John Detler, I, I explained to him, he was like, Oh, he was so embarrassed, this poor old guy. He was like, because I'm like, Yeah, John, you wrote down uh there are two cards in this parachute, and yada yada yada. I'm like, not knowing there should not be two cards in a parachute. He didn't know that. He just said, Oh, you know. He just, you know, so he had no idea. So they had DB Cooper's parachute information the whole time and never knew it. You know. Yeah. So where where did the packing card stuff come from? That was the T Tussauds book or? Um. Okay. So the first thing that we know uh, is so so I think it's yeah Tussau yeah T Tussauds then yeah. So um. Uh. You just got a comment here. Anybody know yeah. when the cigarette butt evidence was officially lost? Okay, so um, what happened is in 1998, when DNA evidence started becoming a thing, Ralph Hope was the was the was the agent was the case agent at the time, and Ralph Hope, um, Ralph Hope, basically was like, okay, I think we can get cigarette, but if we get a cigarette butt, we can test it for DNA, right? So we have a we have a message in the FBI files where he contacts the Vegas office and says, hey, can y'all we all send those cigarettes up here? You know, and Vegas goes, uh, we don't have them. And he goes, and, and we, we have this communication back and forth. And he goes, what do you mean you don't have them? Where are they? And they go, uh, we just checked our files and we kind of realized they had been destroyed in 1971. Our bad. And so mm -hmm. 
it was in it was in about 1998 when they were trying. So, the, so to answer his question before or after DNA technology, during DNA technology, it was that's why they looked for them. Um, was they were like, hey, and they also said, hey, give us that hair slide. Oh, we don't know where that is either. So just a real cluster F, you know, um, of that. But as far as the packing cards, uh, Richard Tussaud spent, he's the only author to this day, he's the only author to have spent legitimate time talking to Tina Mucklow, talking to Flo, Alice, Bill Radicek, he's Bill Mitchell, uh, and he and he did this in the early '80s, so the mem the memories were still roughly fresh, right? Uh, when he interviewed them, and Tina says that Cooper, and this kind of is an indication of Cooper's parachute knowledge. Uh, Tina remembered Cooper bitching about the D rings. He goes, "Hey, there's no D rings on these parachutes." That's really where I I never, I never heard that. Yep, it's in the book. Yeah, T Tina says that Cooper goes, "Hey." These don't have any D-rings, basically saying that the reserve shoots are useless. I can't use these. You know, he goes, they should have known I needed D-rings. Like, what the hell? Yeah. But he, he moves on. Then Tina says that he pulled out. She goes, she observed him looking at cards out of the parachutes, which are packing cards. Okay. So she observes. So she says that she sees Cooper reading the packing cards. Okay. Now, uh, you know, that confirmed. So, you know, people originally for a long time thought that was bull crap. They're like, oh, that's some kind of made up thing, right? Yeah. But now we know through the FBI files that when D.B. Cooper's, when the one that he left on, because remember, he left one parachute on the plane, one, one of the backpacks, it's in the museum now. When they found that backpack that he left on the plane, it had two packing cards in it. Okay, it's almost like, Think of, think of like your car registration, right? I mean, registration papers for your car. Why would you ever have two registration papers in your glove box, right? Basically, that's what occurred is there were two packing cards, okay? And we know that one of those packing cards was for the parachute that Cooper jumped with. So Cooper himself almost certainly pulled both packing cards out of the parachutes and was like, okay, well, I'm going to jump with this one and put put the two cards into back into the into the one he left behind okay so um pretty cool in fact let me let me do a um let me do a demonstration here okay so we're doing this live here i'm gonna get out real quick i'm gonna show you what it looks like okay i'm gonna show you i'm gonna get my uh i have an mb6 up here let's see it's really heavy so i'm not down from my, oh goodness, there we go. Noise here. Oh, everything's dropping. All right, so here, folks, this is the shoot. This is the parachute that Cooper jumped with. Okay, this is an MB6 parachute. Okay, so I have a model here. This is a MB6. It's heavy. Yeah, as I remember when you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, but this is what Cooper jumped with. So the packing cards. Uh, this is where they're located. Okay, uh, they're located. Okay, right here. So let me, let me lift it up a little bit. Damn, I think it's so heavy here. So they're in a pocket right there. So there's a pocket right inside one of these flaps. And if you see here, uh, there's a little pocket here. And I'm pulling out this packing card. So here is what Cooper would have pulled out is this packing card. And uh, this packing card, what packing cards tell you is how old the parachute is. So like, for example, uh, this packing card, let me try to get that. If it's, if it's, uh, it's kind yeah, of Pioneer. Pioneer is kind of get, uh, manufactured type. Yeah. So it says, yeah. So it says then, here, uh, this is February of 1967 is what this says. Yeah. So the one that Cooper jumped with was dated 1960. The one that he didn't take was dated 1957. So my belief is that Cooper picked his parachute because he picked the newer, the newer one. He picked 1960 over, 19, over 1957. So yeah, so these are this is packing cards. Um, so yeah. he so he knew, to for, he knew to look for the packing card. So he had to have, yeah. you know, he wasn't a first time yeah. jumper. He would have had no idea yeah. what that is. And and so that's a clue, really, as to what uh, that's a that's a pretty good clue as to uh, as to uh, Cooper's parachute knowledge that he at least knew that. 
Yeah, and he knew how to put it on, obviously, too, because, you know, Tina offered him the instructions and he uh, declined them. Right. And he put it on like he had done it before. Yeah, Tina said he had done it before. Now, of course, Tina wouldn't know what – Tina would not know what putting on a parachute would look like. So, as a defense attorney, (laughs) I would go – I would say objection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, (laughs) – What's your experience with putting on a parachute, Miss Buckle? Yes, witness has no prior knowledge of what a parachute looks like being put on. (laughs) So whether it's easy or not. Um, so the packing cards though is so, yeah. So basically in the one that he left behind, the one that's currently in the museum, there were two of those cards in it, which tells us that that shouldn't happen. And the only way, the only way that would happen is if Cooper himself did that. So Cooper, um, I don't know if he did that on purpose. Um, yeah, like that's bizarre. Like, I wonder yeah, why, I mean, maybe if he, he did, didn't why, you know, I wonder what he'd get out of that. I don't know. It's almost like he was being courteous in a way. He didn't want to litter or something. I mean, he just, <laughs> uh, and, and, and what's funny is, uh, speaking of litter, I'll tell, tell a real quick story. So I go back to Mac. Mac tore up his ransom note and threw it out the back of the plane. But when he did that, all the money came back and hit him and all the, all the, all the note, all the pieces, um, hit, um, uh, they, um, they, they uh, flew back and hit him in the face. So Mac, threw, so Mac tore up his, his ransom note and tried to throw it off the back of the airplane. And it all it went, flew back. Yeah. And so he was like, look, and, so he, and so he had to like, you know, look around and pick up all the pieces of his ransom note and put it in his pocket. Yeah. Poor Mac. And, the, and the whole the whole Mac story is told in the podcast, American Hijacker, right? It's American, American Hijacker. Skyjacker. Skyjacker. American Skyjacker. American yeah. Skyjacker. And, and if you just Google that podcast yeah you'll find it i think it's all uh, about mac making, right they didn't do they didn't they didn't yeah, do any, anybody else right it's all mac no, isn't it's it? all, all mac and uh they're also making a movie about mac they filmed it i think it's wrapped i think it's wrapped, it's wrapped it's, the filming is wrapped up i think but there they are they, they have filmed a movie about mcnally uh he, he flew out to la a few months ago and met the actor who's playing him um, wow is it the same people that did the podcast or is it uh, different um it's uh different people yeah so, um, but, um, but no, Mac, uh, so yeah, what's funny about Mac is, I remember how I told you that they, that Mac was wearing jeans and a shirt, a polo under his uh, suit and he threw his suit out. Suit. Well, they never found his jacket, but they did find his pants and the FBI were like, oh, uh, the wind must have blown the pants off the skyjacker. <laughs> so the FBI said that they were like, oh, we found these pants. I guess he, the you know, so, so, so we're looking for a guy who lost his pants. I mean, I mean literally, they, they thought he lost his pants in the jump. In fact, Mac was so foolish with jumping. Mac, Mac had such a problem putting on his parachute. He was such a – and I, if Mac watches this, Mac, I, I, I am saying this to you lovingly. <laughs> Mac was a doofus <laughs> at the time when it came to a parachute. He was so bad that the FBI – and this is in all the newspapers – in all the newspapers at the time, it says, and, and I, it's all, all in my book, um, they're like, they think that he was feigning ignorance. They said, no, they said, there's no <laughs> way a skyjacker who jumps out of a 300 mile an hour jet is this stupid with, with parachutes. So we think he's at, he was playing dumb to hide the fact that he was actually an expert sky, ex, expert parachutist. It's like, yeah. no, 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 he really, he really was that silly. And what's funny <laughs> is the FBI, the FBI kept saying there's no, and this is all in the paper, so they're like, he jumped, because see, Mac jumped. The pilots were trying to kill McNally. Literally, they, they've admitted that. And if you read the papers the next day, they're like, yeah, we we cranked that bitch up as fast as they, it would go. And they thought about doing that with Cooper too, right? I mean, yeah, they at thought least about getting like, him out over water, or at least taking the plane over the water. Yeah, they, um, so, so they were trying to, they said, this guy is such a doofus. There's no way he's going to know that we're flying 500 miles an hour or whatever. So the FBI in the papers are like, we're pretty sure he's dead. Nobody could have survived this jump, jumping out of however, and, you know, for whatever speed, right? And honestly, Mac may have set a speed record, you know, for, for parachutists at the time. I don't know. But, but he, anyway. I've forgotten that. He was, he was really moving. Like, Yeah. And what's funny is at his trial, Mac filed a motion. He, his defense filed, Mac filed an actual motion with the court saying, the FBI says the skyjacker could not have survived this jump. I could not be the skyjacker because I am still alive. So, so <laughs> why not? Yeah, I mean, that's what he said. So, you know, I, I wasn't me. I, I'm alive. You know, you said that, you know, you, your own words, you say that people couldn't survive this. 
Yeah, so that's I mean, going, but going going back to Cooper when he gave him the instructions to do a flight ten thousand feet, two hundred miles an hour, how would he even Cooper know if they were if they were going the the requested speed? So he just had to yeah, take their word for it, or they were scared, or, or well, there's a myth there. Cooper never told them how fast to fly. Really, yeah. just the flap settings yeah. in the in the altitude. Yep, gear, flaps, altitude. That's it. Um, he did not give them a speed to fly. And that is why, that, that's why it's like when people say that Cooper knew where he was jumping to, impossible. He had no idea how fast they were going, right? How would he have known, how could he have dropped, jumped to a specific point if he didn't even know how fast they were going? I mean, I mean, yeah. Remember, yeah, there's no way. Plus, you're, you're, you're up so high anyway. Yeah, how can you tell? Yeah, so I mean, it, like I said, going 180 miles an hour was, you know, three miles a minute, right? If they're going... 250 miles an hour. I mean, that's, you know, five miles a minute. I mean, so I mean, like, there's no, if you don't know exactly how fast you're going, how would you know? And Victor 23, the airway is eight miles wide. So even if we assume that Cooper made conditions where they only had to fly down B23, which I don't believe that, um, it's still eight miles wide. So I mean, I mean they could have been anywhere. Yeah. With it. Anywhere yeah. along the, the, yeah, the corridor. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one thing that's interesting about the copycats, too, is um, when you look at how different the skydivers were than the guys like McCoy and Heineman. McCoy and Heineman, I mean, uh, Mac and Heineman and Cooper <clears throat> were just winging it. And that's why we don't think that Cooper was a recreational skydiver. He may have been a military jumper like a Braden, but he wasn't a skydiver because one very important thing, our, our two skydiving parajackers, we'll call them, McCoy and Heaty brought their own parachutes. And if you talk to yeah. any skydiver, they, they will say there's no way I would jump with, with a parachute. I don't Someone else's gear. Right. Yeah. Yeah, never. But they now, didn't pack. Guys, they didn't know who packed it. Yeah. I mean, military guys or novices, doesn't matter to them. They'll just use it, right? But but the skydivers, and also the only two parajackers who gave the crew exact degrees to fly and, and airspeed, yada, 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 were McCoy and Heaty because they jumped to a specific location by having the pilots fly to this uh, spot. Yeah. You know, yeah, McCoy knew the area. McCoy was from the area. What, what's it even oh, yeah. from his home? You know, when he. Which is stupid, though. I mean, like, you know, Dick, you know, don't jump five miles from your home. Like, you know, <laughs> That's crazy. You know, I mean, they're going to know. They knew it, I mean, they knew it was you pretty easily, right? I mean, and of course now yeah. famously Rob Heady, Rob Heady, who was the skydiving champion, right? Rob Heady famously was busted because he had parked his car near where he was planning on landing on off the highway. And his car had a U.S. Parachute Association bumper sticker on it. So when the FBI were looking around, <laughs> they see a car parked on the side of the road that has a USPA sticker on it. And they go, okay. So they just staked out his car. So, so when, so when Heaney comes bouncing down the road after his hijacking, they're like, hands up. He goes, oh, crap, they got me because of his bumper sticker. So that's how that's, I got him. That's hilarious. If, uh, yeah, if the I mean, boy, it was easy to get, you know, he took, uh, Pete Zimmerman drives him home to his neighborhood. I used to, I, sometimes I, I lie and say it was in his front yard, but I think it was further down the street, but he did take road. him to his neighborhood. He did, yeah. yeah, he got and and I and I've not been able to determine whether he bought a milkshake or a, or a coke. Um, it's it's nebulous. Um, the FBI files for, for McCoy have McCoy buying a milkshake and also buying like a drink. So I don't know what he actually bought. Yeah, um, a milkshake. They found all the money except for like eight dollars. They found all the money except for forty bucks. Yeah, they're, they're forty dollars yeah. missing because because he I think he went out to eat I think he went out to eat the next day with his wife. You know. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, and they found all the money in a cardboard box in a closet. Just stupid. Yeah, just, I mean, yeah, I mean, he immediately gets identified. Zimmerman remembers him. Uh, his best friend uh, Van Eyprin was his best friend. Yeah. Knew, knew it immediately. Like, hell, he used to tell me, you know, if he was Cooper, he would have asked for more money. And even well, then, yeah, when it, Van Eyprin told, even Van, when Van Eyprin told, you know, the the police about McCoy, he still refused to believe that it, that he did it. Yeah, and so he just about, said it was so out of character for him. I mean, the thing about Cooper is that he either 
we, we don't know who Cooper is because he either died, okay, or he just never told anybody. I mean, that's something you talk to, you talk to law enforcement, especially in that era, the only surefire way to get away with a crime is don't tell anybody. That's your first step. Yeah. If you never tell anybody what you're up to, then nobody will ever know. So, and I think about a guy like a Braden. I mean, Braden never would have told anybody. I mean, it's just not his, he wasn't bragging on his crimes. No, not know. a bragger. I, you know, I, I like telling the story with Braden and Al Tire because I think he was trying to yeah. wink, wink possibly to Al right. Tire, you know, who was a, a great jumper himself. And he's like, hey, I, what, what did you think about that D.B. Cooper thing? And Al didn't really yeah. pick up on it. And he said that Braden was, uh, was, was dejected at that, that he wasn't interested in db cooper al told me that yeah, personally. he the, said you know he just was dejected that sounds, when i didn't say oh db cooper yeah and that sounds realistic you know that, that maybe you would wink wink to one of your army buddies but not outright yeah. admit it and maybe the only other scenario would be if he had a wife um who was in on it um because like i, I can't imagine like for example let's just say that you know karen mccoy was in on his hijacking she was an accomplice I mean, she, she drove him to the airport. She knew it was going down. Um, I can't picture Karen McCoy ever, you know, ratting on her husband, right? So either Cooper had, it, if he had an accomplice, it had to be a family member or a, or a spouse, or he just never told anybody, or he died. Um, dying is the least likelihood for Cooper, um, honestly, um, just because mm -hmm. it, a parachute's open up. I mean, parachute accidents. Yeah. No, this is good. Way. I definitely want to talk about that. Like, what, what are, because I know a lot of people, they're still a big believer in, okay, he died. Okay. He fell, he crashed in the water. No. Uh, he's a no pool. He argued into the ground. Like, Larry Carr, Larry Carr's still a no pool guy, right? I mean, Larry, he is. He's not and, really moved oh, from that. No. And what's interesting, oh, so, so this is, this is a little thing I'll tell your viewers that a, a special for all the people who are watching is that, um, I guess I guess I can say this. It's your, it's, you've been you've been 50, 50, 52 years, but I talked to John when, when I talked to John Detler, who was John Detler was there that night. He was there in at the airport that night. You know, John Detler was on the sled test. John, I mean, he was one, one of the original guys. I asked him. I said, "Be be be real here. You know, lawyer to lawyer." I was like, "You know, what did you guys really think about Cooper?" And he goes about his survival. He goes, oh, we knew right away he got away with it. We knew he, we, we knew he lived. You know, we just weren't going to tell the media that, you know, we were never going to say. Or, or encourage I mean, hijack. Yeah, right. And he got a laugh. I was like, well, that didn't really work, did it? <laughs> because they got all the copycats. But um, no, they, they he said, yeah, we, he said, we knew that when, when, we, when no one found a body in their backyard, when nobody, they were looking for vultures too, um, which is interesting. I mean, they were looking for vultures and that's in the FBI files. They were looking for vultures in the woods, you know, um, things like that. When they said, when he said within a week, we didn't, no body was found, we knew he got away. And um, there is mm -hmm. even, there is in the FBI files, and it's going, going in my book, Thomas Manning, who was the agent in charge of all the ground searches. Um, we have a we have an FBI file from Thomas Manning in '73 where he says, "Look, there is no indication whatsoever that Cooper's parachute did not deploy. There is no indication whatsoever that he that he did not survive this. Uh, we believe he has absconded the area, you know, within hours of jumping, and he's gone. You know, I mean, so we have them saying that. So all of their Unsolved Mysteries, Ralph Himmelsbach, all of their in search of all the media appearances for the FBI where they're saying, oh, he died, he died, he died, he died, was all just posturing. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, what are they going to say? Cossie. Well, shit, he got away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what are they going to say? Well, he got away. I mean, and if, again, you know, like you said, Cossie, Cossie changed his tune. Because it, when, when he when changed his tune, read, I mean, he, 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 he survived. The, uh, in search of, he, he, I think at the end of the In Search of video, Cossie said, oh, yeah, this is survivable. Are you kidding me? Like totally full on, yeah. and then, then he does a 180. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we have Kasi two days after the hijacking being interviewed saying, This is, of course, he survived. Basically, one, okay, so there, there, there is a parachute malfunction, one out of every 100,000 jumps. That is how reliable yeah. parachutes are. 
Yeah, one, they, I think it was Marty. Did not. Marty do the uh, the research on the D Day uh, paratroopers well, yeah. and how many? You know, I mean, just to, it, no, it was on the pilots. It was on our. It was on our pilots. Oh, the pilots. Yeah, that's right. Crew. Yeah, basically they had like the bailout, a the air crew bailout, the bailout, like air crew bailout in World War II. Allied of allied pilots, were right. British and American, there was a ninety-seven percent survival rate if they managed to jump out. Now again, that's even going to be skewed because how many of those guys were wounded when they rolled out of the plane, right? You know, and you know, so I mean, that's already that three percent who didn't survive, you know, are guys who are having to bail out of not stationary lowered stairs they're jumping out of death spiraling aircraft on fire you know and their yeah. survival rates that high and, and none of those guys I'm, I'm talking about like none unless they were unless they were shot down twice or three times which some of those guys in the battle of britain some of those british pilots were shot down four or five times and bailed out and got back in a plane the next two hours later they're up in the air you know those guys did but nobody in world war ii had a practice jump, unless you were a paratrooper, right? Yep. No pilots. And I've done extensive research on that. The extent of, of air crews training was, this is how you put it on. This is what you do, you pull. Because I mean, look, it's almost like, look, man, you're lucky to even have this parachute, really. <laughs> I mean, you're lucky to even have a chance to live if you shot down. That's kind of how yeah. they viewed it. You know? Yeah. And, and, the and they had to work. The bottom line is they work. They work. They I do. Mean, yeah. the bottom and, line. And, and, they work. And, yeah. you know, if, if he did jump closer to, if Cooper jumped closer to battleground, what were the, the, the ratio to water to land? I mean, it's, no, it's no, still no pretty water. cold. But, you know, you have the Columbia There's, over there, but that's really, about it. I mean, you're away I mean, from Lake Merwin now, so you don't even have Lake Merwin to deal with. Yeah. 98%. If, if you, it, I've seen this before too. Um, if you take out Lake, if you take out, um, if you take out Lake Merwin and you take out, um, the river, Clark County, Washington, which is a big, big county, is ninety-eight percent land. Okay, so it's ninety-eight percent land. If you take out Merwin and and um, and uh, in the river, and like I said, he jumped well past Lake Merwin. There's no chance he went into Lake Merwin. Now, now that we know that he's jumped way further south, um, and he, and we know that he didn't jump far enough to be, to land in the river because I mean, again, the only way he lands in the river. Think about this, Cooper's parachute, if he deployed immediately, he's gonna drift two miles northeast because the winds are coming from the southwest. Yeah. Not, so he's gonna drift two miles, two, three, two, two to three miles northeast. So if he lands in the Columbia, hell, he's jumping over downtown Portland, basically. Who would do who would do that? Yeah. Nobody would do that, right? That'd be stupid. I mean, again, you're gonna land on a the top of a building, you know, or land on a cop car at a four-way stop. No. So he jumped in that sweet spot, you know. But yeah, Cooper. Uh, I'm um, a believer. I'm a believer in battleground. I mean, that just it makes yeah, all the sense in the world. It makes the most sense. He would, if he jumped, um, and that's why that the, the Heisen store burglary is kind of intriguing because Heisen is actually where if if if, if Cooper jumps over battleground. Yeah, explain the Heisen store miles, break in again, where where they think that might have been Gibby Cooper. Uh, he he broke into the store. He, what he took? He stole cigarettes, and he, so he stole. Okay, so yeah, for those who don't know, there was a break. So Heising is an unincorporated community about two or three miles northwest northwest of Battleground. It has one store. Okay, it is a it's the post office. It's the general store. It's like the all store. It's the all purpose store. And um, the night of the hijacking, at about ten o'clock. Um, there was a break-in, and the burglar took cigarettes, gloves, and beef jerky. That's it. Now, didn't take booze, didn't take alcohol. I mean, that's it. really interesting. The timing of that is almost uncanny, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Heisen store is really intriguing. Um, and they've not – That is, especially with the battleground, you know, drop zone. Uh, drop zone. Yeah. Yeah, and see the FBI again. Here's the thing about the here's the here's the problem with the FBI. It's not just that it's not just that the FBI screwed up, or well, Northwest Airlines screwed up the drop, not the FBI. John Dettler made that very clear. He's like, well, we didn't. He said we didn't screw up anything. You know, yeah. Northwest told us this. We're just you know going off their word. He was like, I was like, I was like, John, believe me, in my book, I defend you guys. I'm saying that 
they messed up. Not, not you guys. He's like, you got really defensive. He's like, Ur. um. Anyway, so the, it's not, it's not only the fact that the that the drop zone is screwed up that they didn't find anything. It's that they canvassed the drop. They went to every single, I mean, literally every single house and business in the in the in the. I don't know how many square miles it was in their drop zone was visited multiple times asking, what did you see that night? Did anybody, anything weird, right? The problem is that what if they had asked those questions to people living in battleground or orchards, right? Like for example, picture a scenario, picture a scenario where the kid working at the 7-Eleven in orchards, a weird guy walked in and said, can I use your phone, right? Well, he would never report that to the authorities as being D.B. Cooper because well, Cooper was 10 miles north of here. Yeah. So why would he Yeah. So how many leads were lost because they uh, yeah. huge yeah. missed opportunity. A lucky yeah. break. I mean Yeah, I mean exactly. For example, if that if if the kid at the 7 Eleven had said, Hey, yeah, some this weird guy walked in, then they would then they would probably the FBI would, you know, would have would have checked those phone records and maybe could have found an accomplice that way or something, right? The FBI did search all pay phones in Clark County um, for long distance calls from the night of the hijacking. They actually did that. So in the FBI files, there's like 40 numbers that are all redacted, but they, they, they checked all the, all the numbers that were long distance calls from pay phones. In Clark wow. County. There was around 40, 40 yeah. calls, but you know, long distance calls that, made that, that night. Yeah. So that's and I, guess, cool. I assume they that called means, all the numbers and said, do you know, <laughs> you, yeah. are you missing yeah, I mean, a loved one? Look, that's why it, it makes you, it, it, they messed up. Like the FBI messed up in hindsight on the cigarettes, the hair slide, you know, but again, the problem with the cigarettes is, yeah, they should have kept those, but they didn't know what DNA was. I mean, it's like, it's, you're, it's hindsight, you know, now they should have kept it, but I can almost give them some excuse to say, look, they didn't, it's just cigarettes, right? And again, they assumed they were going to find the guy. They never thought that. I mean, the FBI had that's never. Good. That's a great point. Case. No, I, that that is a great point. They probably they, never they assumed, see this going on this long. Yeah, and what's interesting, if you notice this, check this out too. So, uh, when it came time for McCoy's skyjacking, they were a lot more thorough. If you read the three hundred twos from McCoy's skyjacking, they took out the seats, the seat belts. They they did a lot better job of, of fingerprinting things, and let's talk about the, and, and we can talk about the fingerprints real quick. Cooper yeah, talk about certain, that in the uh, in the in the uh, palm print. Palm print, yeah. So a lot of people don't know anything about the palm print. No, so Cooper they have eleven fingerprints from around Cooper's chair, and all eleven are partial prints. So there, none, none of them are complete fingerprints that you'd expect. Yeah, same with the Zodiac which, case. It's all partials. Yeah, which tells you that he either wiped it, wiped his area down or more likely obfuscated his fingers prints somehow by putting wax on them or glue or something like that, right? Because back then, fingerprints were DNA, right? You know, all criminals oh, knew, yeah, knew, that knew was the DNA. fingerprints. Yeah, so they knew, okay, I need to protect myself. McCoy wore gloves, Mac wore gloves, Heineman wore gloves. All these guys wore gloves because they knew. Well, Cooper wouldn't wear gloves because he, his fingerprints were obfuscated, I think. But, the, but he did leave a palm print on his chair, like when he stood up, right? If you stand up from a chair, you put your, fit, hand, you put your hands down. You yeah, is that like, down a, on, on like a vinyl? Like, was it, or was it, was it cloth? No, no, no. It was like the metal. Was it like a vinyl? Well, I mean, think okay. about like, you know, I mean, like the metal of a chair, right? You know, the, 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 um, uh, unlike an airplane where like the ashtray, you know, those old, you know, those old airplanes had like, you know, metal seat, you know, armrests essentially. So that's where it comes from, an armrest of him putting his hand down. So the FBI, we do have, we're almost, they are 100% positive almost that they've got D.B. Cooper's palm print. Um, now, again, Palm prints were not collected by the military. They still aren't. Okay. Palm prints are not collected by the military. Um, and uh, law enforcement, the LAPD and the NYPD did not collect palm prints until 2003. So, That's interesting. Yeah. So really, 
the only way they got palm prints <clears throat> was um, uh, by asking suspects is they would say, look, and we have this all in the FBI files. They'd go, hey, uh, the best way to clear yourself is to give us your palm prints. And they go, okay, sure. And they give the palm prints, they test it. Rackstraw, famously, Rackstraw refused to give his palm prints. He said, I'm not giving you shit. And so the FBI are like, well, God damn it. But this is when they were investigating. So they investigated Rackstraw when he was on trial yeah. for murdering his stepfather. Okay. That was when right. they. Which he did, which he got off of, but he did do. <laughs> kind of like yeah, an OJ course. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so um, the FBI contacted the attorney contacted the contacted the, the attorney general's office and said look can we like tie him down is there a way to like come make him give us a palm print can we do that and the in the attorney general's office was like not really you can't make him do that so ragstraw kept saying i'm not giving you anything but then ragstraw he gets off the murder he gets arrested a few months later again for like a, having a forged pilot's license and when he's taken into custody the, the uh, Sacramento police or whoever, they're like, give us your palm prints. And he goes, yeah, sure. And he gives them his palm prints. And they immediately contact the FBI saying, we have his palm prints, finally. And the FBI's like, yes, send them to us. No match. So one other. Wow. So they so do you, do you believe that that's Cooper's palm print? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I think so. Because again, um, the flights were not, for whatever reason, the flights that day were not, particularly full. I mean, you know, they flew, you know, flight 305 started that day in Washington, DC. They flew from Washington to to Minneapolis. They picked up, I think one passenger in Minneapolis. He's that, he was a, uh, yeah, the med the flight, I mean, the crew was based out of Minneapolis. All right. Wasn't it? Right. That's, yeah. Cause, cause um, that's where Northwest airlines Minne is. Minneapolis, Tina. Yeah. To, all, yeah. All of them live there. I mean, you know, Bill Radichek and Harold Anderson still live up there. You know, but anyway, they go from Washington oh, wow. to to Minneapolis. Then they go from they pick up one person in Minneapolis. Okay, then they fly to uh, Great Falls, uh, Great Great Falls, Montana. Then they fly to Missoula, Montana. Then they fly to Spokane. Then they fly to Portland, then to Seattle. Um, so, but but it was very. I don't think anybody sat in that chair um, that day. Okay, so the palm print's probably his, and the hair is probably his. Mm -hmm. Now, I always joke about, yeah. watch us, I always joke and say, watch us find that hair slide. We're going to find that hair slide, and they're going to DNA test it, and it's going to be the hair of a circus dwarf who flew from Missoula <laughs> to Portland, you know, and sat in his chair. And we're going to be like, oh, my yeah. God. That would be yeah, you get, your, your, you get your hopes up, and then... Yeah, because yeah, you were saying I mean, earlier, you think the hair is going to be the only way. But, uh, you know, speaking of that, do you think Tina can remember anything? And another question for you is, if you interview Tina, what would you ask her specifically? Or or, would it, or or does it really matter because you think she just can't remember? That's a damn good question. Now, I will preface this by saying, if I ever spoke to Rax to to uh, Radicek, which I, I think I will at some point, whenever when I, I'll just say I'm going to. Whenever I speak to Bill Radicek, I'm going to ask him. You guys, I'm going to say, look, you spoke to DB Cooper. He spoke to him. They had a back and forth discussion on the airphone, the uh, whatever they call that. On the airphone, yeah. I mean, they, he spoke to him about yeah. where they were going to, um, mainly about where they were going to refuel. So you know, because because yeah. Cooper told them because they said they said Mexico and, and then they and, yeah well they well, they said look we can stop and refuel in Los Angeles and Cooper goes no no that's too busy he goes Los Angeles is too busy that's no go and they go what about San Francisco he goes that's too busy too and they go okay well we can do Yuma or Reno and he goes well uh, Reno's fine by me and so they go okay so I want to ask a write a check what did what was your opinion of him. Did you think when you talked to him, did you feel that you were talking to a contemporary, a, a, a professional like yourself? Or were you talking to a kind of a, lo a lower rent mechanic type yeah, of guy? Right? Or a hick or, a, you know. Yeah, yeah. Hick or, yeah. What did you think? Now, I think I think we have the answer in the FBI files. I mean, when you, when you read the transcripts, Bill Radicek tells Northwest Airlines, he goes, this guy seems to know a thing or two about an airplane. 
And, you know, he says that. So he's kind of giving him the, uh, but if I had to, God, what would I talk to Tina? I've never thought about that because I, I do feel like that her memory, I mean, I, I, I realized that it was an event, but again, I've had some things happen in my life, some scary, some scary shit, some scary days in my life. And I don't remember that. And that was 15 years ago or so, right? I can't remember much of it all, much anything of it. I can't imagine 50 years later. So I, yeah, I really don't imagine looking back. Know. Yeah. I, oh, okay. I know what I would ask. Yes. Yes. I do know what I would ask. What did the money look like? How was the money packaged? Yeah. Was it all that talk about the bank top hands, what she said, and and that's been boiled over (laughs) over and over. Well, but it's almost irrelevant in a way because we don't know exactly how the money was found at Tina Bar because they didn't take pictures of it. It's not like they left it in the hole and took a picture of it. And I and I I love Brian. Brian Ingram's a friend of mine, but I don't trust the word of an eight-year-old of a memory from eight years, from when you're eight years old, right? Of how yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially when you read Sky Jack and, and there's these thoughts of mine wondering if it wasn't actually his cousin that dug the money up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Denise was her name. Yeah. In yeah. fact, the, the current thinking is that it was probably both of them. They were both digging in the sand with sticks. Oh, really? Just messing around. Kids do. Yeah. And they, they're both like, Oh, look money. You know? Um, and in fact, in the FBI files, we have Denise's mother, who was Denise's mother was Brian's mother's sister. So Denise was his first cousin on his mom's side. Um, we have her telling the FBI, Dwayne Ingram is telling the wrong story. He's saying he told his kid to go dig a fire pit and Brian found the money. Well, that ain't what happened. Brian and my daughter were digging, were just messing around doing what kids do, you know, digging in the sand, you know, and they found it. Um, that we had, and that's in the files from like the day after the, you know, that, yeah, that just found. sounds, it sounds plausible. Yeah, it does. And so, um, anyway, but no, I would ask her how the money was, how the money was packaged. Now, again, we have spoken to Bill Grinnell. Bill Grinnell was the guy who packaged, who, who Bill Grinnell was the security officer at Seafirst Bank. He's still alive. He said that the money was in five packet. Like think about like a, a packet of money with the paper strap, you know, strap money, like little money packets, right? He said it was five packets, okay, of two thousand dollars each. So I'm not good at math, but I guess two thousand twenties or two thousand dollars in twenties is a hundred twenties, I think. Yeah. So it was a hundred. It was a hundred twenties in a packet. He said it was five packets bundled together. Like think about like a bank bundle. You know, that, you know, banks will bundle money together. Mm-hmm. Bill Grinnell said it was five packets with, um, you know, it was five packets with uh, um, bundled together with rubber bands on each side. Now, Brian only found three packets, right? Right. So if the original bundles had five packets, that's curious, right? Makes you go, hmm, makes you wonder if, the money on Tina Barr was repackaged at some point, right? Was, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, that was the whole yeah, I mean, thing. Was it repackaged? And if it was yeah. repackaged, then it was probably planted. It was planted there or discarded there. My theory, okay, my pet theory, I'll, I'll make a fool of myself for all your viewers because everybody, everybody's everybody got a Tina Barr theory because all of them are bullshit because nobody knows. It's all speculation. Um, my, <laughs> yeah, my, it's thought, speculation. my thought is this. Cooper was a generous guy. Remember, Cooper offered the stewardesses money. That's true. Yeah, he offered Cooper, Tina tips and the, the crew. He, and yeah, meals, he bought the meals. They never ate them, right? The dogs ate them. Or... The dogs ate the meals. Cooper was a generous guy. Cooper offered Tina thousands of dollars. And, of course, she laughs and goes, oh, I can't. And he meant it. Like, he offered her a, a stack, right, or a pack. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, Mac, Mac gave his stewardesses $2,500, which they kept. Uh, now they turned oh, wow. over the FBI because they're like, they're like, they're like, Hey, it might have his fingerprints on it, you know, whatever. So, but he, Matt gave his stewardess his money. Okay. But anyway, my thinking is that Cooper, like McCoy hitchhiked and got a ride. And when he got to his destination, 
he either left a bundle as a gift for the driver in the car, or as he's getting out of the car, says, hey, thanks, kid, and throws him a bundle or whatever, right? And the kid goes, okay, what the hell, money? And, and, but, and before he can say, hey, you know, he's walked off, right? The kid's driving down the road. He's driving down lower, he's driving down, you know, uh, a lower river road near Tina Bar, okay, which was a road. And he hears on the news about the skyjacking and goes, oh shit, I'm an accomplice. I've got some of the money. He just throws it out the window, right? Yeah, that makes just, sense. Yeah, just, oh shit, I'm an accomplice now. You know, uh, and you know, just toss it like it's a snake in his car. Oh shit. I mean, we, you know, we would all do that. I don't want hot money in my car from a skyjacking. You know, oh shit, that was the guy. And my thought is that if you look at a map, so south of Tina Bar is, Tina Bar is about, 300 yards from the the road that goes by there, okay? It's kind of, Tina Bar is kind of- a, Yeah, and that's all Fazio's property. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, there's Fazio land and then there's Tina Bar. Well, about a mile south of Tina Bar, the river, it's called Caterpillar Island. Um, about a mile south of Tina Bar uh, is, is um, the road is only about 20 yards from- there's a whole stretch of land next to the road. The road's only about 20 yards from the river. So my thought is that this kid or whoever just chunked it out around that spot. And now money does not float. We have determined that un for all your viewers, testing has been done by Tom <laughs> K. Testing has been done by Chris Cunningham. Yeah, Chris Tom Cunningham K put did. a bank bundle in his bathtub and it sank. Money does not float. And now a dollar bill will float, but not a bundle. It gets waterlogged and sinks. But yeah, it'll sink during the it'll sink. But during flooding, though, it let's just say that the kid threw the money out and sit and it lays in the weeds, just this bank bundle, right? Well, during the big flood of 70, there's a huge flood in 72, in like April of 72. During the flooding, the water just you know all picks up debris. It's called um sedimental. It's called fluvial sediment berry burial. When like flooding will just wow. push debris down, you know, down where it's going, right? So I, I think maybe that bundle that the kid or whoever threw out the window was pushed along by um, debris and settled on Tina Bar, you know. So now that's my that's my thought is that it's just it was. It, I like the it. money on Tina Bar has nothing to the money on Tina Bar has nothing to do with Stevie Cooper. It's another person put it, just threw it out the window. He didn't bury it. Nobody buries money. He just throw it in the river. But I think the kid just probably threw it out the window. I call him a kid. I mean, it could have been an eight year old. It could have been a you know seventy year old woman. Who knows? But whoever gave him a ride, you know, I mean, think about this. We use these things. This is this is why the copycats are so important. This is why my copycat book is important. Because we can learn a lot from how humans do this same crime. McCoy hitchhiked. Mac hitchhiked with a sheriff. Yeah. Um, we Heineman told yeah. nobody what he did. We don't know, but but we you know we we now Lapointe was captured immediately. Lapointe was followed to the ground at in his parachute. He jumped in. Uh, he jumped during the day. Lapointe was out of his mind a little bit. He jumped during the day. He was circled on his way down by a jet, by a fighter jet going, I see you. You know, we see you. So as soon as he landed, he <laughs> really couldn't stop. Yeah, LaPointe broke his ankle. Um, kind of remember, I told you LaPointe had oh, so he, LaPointe yeah, was a door says. gunner. Yeah, 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 LaPointe was a door gunner in Vietnam. And he had a lot of like problems. He testified to this during his trial. He had a lot of problems with like Think of like full metal jacket or whatever, right? I mean, you, you know, you don't lead them so much. The whole joke about, you know, how do you shoot women and children, right? Yeah. You don't lead them so much, right? He was that guy. He he talked about shooting people from his oh, yeah. chopper and it gave him problems, right? And what's sad about it is when 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 he was being arraigned, when he was being arraigned, when LaPointe is in court for his arraignment, he has this giant cast on his leg because he broke his broke his ankle. And the judge says, son. Don't worry, you're going to get free medical treatment. You're going to get free medical treatment for your ankle. And the point goes, how about free mental treatment? How about that? Yeah, and the, yeah he knew he needed some help. Yeah, he was like, I need help, man. I, my brain's yeah. good. Yeah, the rest of the cash. Yeah, exactly. So, so 
yeah. the proportion of the cash, that, that's the issue. It's you know, 97% of the cash is missing. Now, let's talk about this, Mark. I'll tell Mark this. So um, the FBI asked the Treasury Department, we have a 302 where the FBI says, hey, how long does a twin R bill, this is, in, this, this is in 1971 or 72, how long does it last in circulation? And the Treasury Department wrote back and said, a twin R bill, average lifespan, this is shocking, but I think this speaks to how much currency was used during the time, cash money, right? 18 months, a twin R bill before it was pulled from circulation had an average lifespan of 18 months, okay? Now, they did not start cataloging the serial numbers of money that was, of destroyed money that was pulled until 1990. 1990 was the first year that the Treasury Department started cataloging the serial numbers of, of destroyed money. So- Why? What was the reason for it? I don't know why. They just, Catalog. I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess the computer technology probably got good enough to start scanning, you know, but they didn't do that. So when people say that the, you know, no, you know, you know, none of the money has ever turned into circulation. Well, we don't, we don't know that because a twenty dollar bill only lasted eighteen months. You know, so I mean, we had nineteen years when all money that was pulled wasn't even cataloged. So that money could have been spent. You know, hell, he, I mean, he could have gone to Honduras or he could have gone to anywhere and laundered it. You know, I mean. You know, nobody's checking twin R bills back then. I mean, I know that there were the, the, some only a could few. Have been, yeah, could have been why he asked for those. Yeah, and look, here's the thing too. The FBI asked the LA Times, the FBI asked the, the San Francisco Chronicle. They said, Hey, will you guys publish our serial numbers? We have 10,000 serial numbers. And 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 um the papers were like, You gotta pay us, bro. This ain't no charity. If we're going to take up all that space in our paper, you got to pay us about fifteen hundred bucks. So the so so the Seattle agents fire off a letter <laughs> to the DC office saying uh, they want fifteen hundred dollars to publish the serial numbers. Hoover goes hell no, <laughs> and so they were never published in any mm -hmm. newspaper. The money, the the serial numbers. So I mean, who was who was who was yeah. checking that? You know, yeah, the banks supposedly had it, but you know, or maybe the casino, yeah, but nobody was, was any, I mean, who would have the time to check it? No, and they weren't even in order. I mean, they were just randomized. So, I mean, I mean, you got to check 10,000 numbers, no way, this is not realistic. The only, the oh, only, yeah, there's just uh, not going to happen, especially in the uh, pre computer, you know, yeah, the only argument for it really is the star notes. So, I don't know if you know about star notes, so you know, like. Um, star notes are mm -hmm. collector's items for currency. So it's like, basically, um, I'm trying to remember essentially or, what a star note is, but some currency, like, I think it's like, if a serial number is accidentally like listed twice somehow when the treasury makes money, they put a star, they put a star next to it. So they're called star notes. There were, I think there's 80, there's like 87 star notes, um, in, so if you look, so if you go to my website, my website nordjack.org has all yeah 10, the, the link the link is in the uh, description yeah. for this video. I've got all right, ten thousand serial numbers. You can see the, what, some of the numbers have a star next to them. These are big time collectors' items. If you go to eBay and type in like star note, you know they go for a lot of money, right? And so I've spent a lot. Of, I know Marty Andrade spent a lot of time. I've spent several days looking at eBay for 1969 twin R bill star notes, trying to match the numbers and, and none of them match. Cause I mean, that would be something because, and that's something mm -hmm. that we could, we could, it narrows it down instead of, instead of checking all 10,000 numbers, you can check the star notes because those are collector's items. You know, those aren't mm -hmm. discarded by people when they find Yeah, them, they're so. preserved. They're preserved. Yeah. So I've never, but I've never found one and Marty's never found one. Uh, yeah. The only Cooper money ever is the Tina bar money. Yeah, that's it. Not one other twenty has ever turned up in circulation. I know. Uh, yeah. So that's what Darren I had a guy on Cooper Vortex that said, "No, there's no way. If it showed up, we would have found it." I, I can't. I think that was. Yeah, I don't buy that at all. Darren guess said, "I, I, I don't. I never did." Out. The guy's super smart, that but seems, I never really bought it. Well, I don't buy that. Yeah, and if yeah, I mean, 
but that's what I would ask Tina is how the money was packaged, I guess. Um, but I mean, look, when you read the FBI files, you've got Tina Mucklow saying that the whole thing is becoming foggy in her memory you know, a yeah. year after, uh, less than a year after. I mean, so, you know, and then you have Florence five years later saying, I have no idea anymore. Um, yeah. Bill can't remember it. either. You, you know, I know you met yeah, Bill. No, Bill you know, he's, he's honest about it. Like, I, you know, you could show me the, the guy that, that we would actually know is D.B. Cooper and he can't remember. Yeah. Bill made the best comparison. Bill said, do you remember the face of a substitute teacher you had in second grade? No way. Great analogy. He said, no way. So he said, people show me pictures. The only thing that Bill remembers distinctly in his mind, he said, it's never really left his mind, is the turkey neck. He said, yes, like, that, I, that's why I always put a lot of capital into the turkey neck because it was an honest yeah. uh, description from a guy that was jealous. He was looking at Cooper. He's jealous. Why are they talking He's to this old, on this old geek? And not paying attention yeah. to me, the 22 year old football player going back to college, 6'2, right? Um, yeah, strapping. And they're man, fawning yeah. over this dweeb, basically a dweeb yeah. or, you know, geeky looking yeah, guys. He, he said, was... Yeah. So he, and he, he knew, like, so he, that was an honest thing that they, he remembered two things. He remembered yeah. that Cooper spilled a drink and he remembered the turkey neck, which uh, the FBI wrote down his sagging chin. Yeah, his sagging chin. He also remembers. Well, it's not listed, but it's interesting. So in Tucson, and I've spoken to Bill Mitchell about Tucson. I said, do you remember talking to Tucson? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, Mr. Tucson was a great guy, real nice guy. Um, this is back in like 81. I mean, Bill Mitchell, when you talk to Bill Mitchell, Bill's still on like 30 years old at the time, right? Uh, in the Tucson book, he says that Cooper had long johns or something. Bill says that he saw that Cooper had something sticking out from the bottom of his pants, something different. And that's in Tucson. And wow. so, yeah. And I take that as, I mean, Tucson was a lawyer, FBI agent. He wasn't going to just make shit up. He got that yeah. from somewhere, you know, and that came from Bill. Um, so Cooper had something underneath his pants, whether it was a different set of pants like McNally or whether it was long johns, something like that. He had something going on there. Um, but Bill also, interestingly, Bill, only three people saw the mystery bag, okay? Tina, Nancy House, who was a witness who saw it because she saw Cooper come out of the bathroom. Cooper had to take, Cooper, Cooper had to take a leak or something. Cooper goes mm -hmm. to the bathroom when they land, and Cooper takes his briefcase and, and his mystery bag, was, was on top of his briefcase, into the bathroom. Bill Mitchell also sees the bag. Now, my belief is that Cooper's mystery bag was under his seat the whole time, which makes sense. You put Boy. things under your seat. And the reason that Bill Mitchell sees it, think about this, Bill has a, Bill's the only passenger who has a side profile view of Cooper, right? That's why he sees the turkey neck, you know, and we have FBI files where Bill asks the FBI, could y'all do a side profile sketch? I think I could do that. And they mm -hmm. never did it. Sad. Yeah, it was like I think I can do it, and Tina says that too. Tina says I saw him from the yeah, side. I can she's sitting by. Yeah, and it would be nice to know because I mean we don't know how long his nose was, right? A side profile would help. All we have is a front yeah. view. We don't know if his nose is long or yeah. Short. There's no profile. Yeah, and so but but Bill, the thing with this, if you're sitting across the aisle from somebody, you you can see under their seat. So I think that's why Bill was able to see the mystery bag because it was under Cooper's seat. Whereas if yeah, you're Florence, he had that vantage Alice, point. Yeah, it was, it was, he had a unique perspective on it, right? And here's something else, too. I believe that the mystery bag was in the briefcase um, when wow. he boarded the plane. This is what I said. So consider this. Tina describes the bomb as being in the left corner of the briefcase. Now, when you say the bomb is in the left corner of the briefcase, that means that there's extra room in the briefcase, right? If, if it's in one corner, that means that there's dead space. Clearly, it, otherwise you would just say it takes up the whole, it take, otherwise you would just say that, the, you would just say that the bomb takes up the entire um, area, right? Well, well, so, but no, she says it's in the left, she says it's in the left corner of the briefcase was the bomb. If you're walking through the airport, carrying a briefcase down by your side, just walking down the road, you're walking down there, 
do you want a bomb or even your even your fake bomb bouncing around inside there? No. You don't want your bomb bouncing around as you're walking down walking down the road or, or walking down the if you're walking to the airport terminal with a briefcase bomb down by your side. You know, you don't want the bomb bouncing around. So I think that Cooper, he had something in the mystery bag. We don't know what it was, but I think that he the mystery bag was in the briefcase as stuffing, essentially. It kept mm -hmm. the bomb from rattling around as he's walking. So when Cooper gets on the plane, opens the briefcase takes the mystery bag out and throws it under his chair. Now, for those who are watching, the mystery bag, we call it that because we have no idea what, what was in it. Now, whatever was in it was not used during the hijacking. The only thing that Cooper emerged from his pockets, essentially, that we know of, are the cigarettes, his matches, and a pocket knife. It's yeah, the only like thing I think cut the shroud lines with and do attach yeah, though. Those are the only things shift. that he like that, that he like, you know, you know, you know, came out of thin air essentially. So, but he had this bag that was almost as big as his briefcase. It was described as about four inches tall, four inches tall, and about the size of the briefcase. Uh, Tina described it as the size of a, 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 a as the size of a department store. Shop yeah, like bag. a box that you would, yeah. I thought it was like a yes. box, like you'd put a shirt in, you know, at a department. Yeah, store. yeah. So whatever was in there was not used in the hijacking, which means that whatever was in there was only used during his jump or during his escape. Yep. So, yeah. And we can look at, we can, yeah, I think, and I think Cooper had a pistol in there. I, I am, listen, Heineman had a pistol, McCoy had a pistol, Mac. LaPointe had a pistol, uh, Every single one of these guys, like so. So Melvin Fisher is the hijacker who we never talk about. Melvin Fisher was a 49-year-old painter, down on his luck, failed businessman, hijacks a plane in Oklahoma City, gets two hundred thousand dollars and doesn't jump. He gets on the bottom of the stairs and chickens out. He's the chicken. We have five guys. We have five copycats who did jump. Then we have one who gets scared and says, eh, "He's he's 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 down there for an hour." Scared, I don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. He goes up to the cockpit, knocks on the door. They're like, ah, <laughs> they hear a knock on the door, and there he is. He hands he hands them a pistol, which they didn't know he had. They had no idea he had a pistol because he had a fake bomb, also like Cooper. Okay, like, oh, where where this pistol come from? Mac McNally had a pistol that was hidden in a mystery bag. Okay, think about this. If if, if Cooper was called on, if they called Cooper's bluff on the bomb, right? If they say, hey, that's bullshit, that's not a bomb, he has to have something else to, right. you know, another instrument to get his hijacking. So I think he had a pistol on him. I mean, because every other, literally all of them, Fisher, Point, Heaty, uh, McCoy, and McNally all had pistols. So it makes perfect sense that Cooper would have one too. Um, so I think in his mystery bag, I think he had, I think he had um, a pistol, probably had a goggles, gloves, uh, a compass for sure. You've got yeah, have a compass. Would have been huge. Right. Maybe a flashlight. Although I asked Mac, I said, what, I said, did you have a flashlight? He goes, no, no, no. I would not have a flashlight because I wouldn't want anybody to see me using a flashlight in the woods, right? Yeah. So I would have thought about having a flashlight. I think I, I think a canteen. Would have been a smart. Yeah, that would have been thing smart. To in there. Yeah, he Maybe had something food. in there that was important. He had something in there that we don't know about. You know, so it's um, I think the mystery bag uh, is really interesting. I, th I think that I mean, because we just we'll never know what was in the mystery bag. And I mean, look, the FBI considered that that he may have had a a transponder um, in there, which you know can you know or or, or a radio, for example, a, a portable radio. Yeah. So he, so he could hear if they're searching for him or not. And I am, it's not, it is never mentioned in McCoy's um, FBI file, but McCoy gave the pilots um, specific, you know, flight path to follow. McCoy also gave the pilots specific frequencies he wanted them to be on, okay? To communicate. Yeah, like, he knew his know, stuff. Which, which tells me, that McCoy may have had a radio in the back so he could listen yeah. 
to yeah, he what must the pilots have. are telling the Air Force, right? I think he did. Which uh, is smart. No I tablets. mean, which is smart. Yes, it was, it was smart. And no dose tablets. Cooper did yeah. have Benzedrine. Benzedrine. Which is now, uh, obviously, as we know with Drew, uh, McAbee saw uh, special forces. They used it. Benzedrine. Yeah, those in their getaway bags, yeah. they called it. Yeah. Yep. But I did some more research on on um, on Benzedrine. Benzedrine was basically Adderall at the time. Yeah. It was prescribed yeah, like for Adderall. attention deficit disorder. Keep you it awake. Was described, yeah. Wait, wait, but it was described as amphetamine, right? But see, I have, I have, I don't know, if, I don't know if y'all can tell, but I have ADHD really bad. Um, so um, clearly, um, I take Adderall. Now I can fall asleep on Adderall. I mean, most people, it's it's literally I mean, the Adderall is, is literally amphetamine. It's speed, right? If I'm on Adderall, I can fall asleep because my brain chemistry is different. It calms me down. So Benzedrine was prescribed for people with ADHD back then. It was their version of Adderall, Ritalin, you know. So it wasn't just military. It was prescription for some Yeah, people. yeah, it wasn't that exclusive. It wasn't exclusive to No, it was also uh, for 18-wheelers, too. Um, 18-wheeler 18, 18 drivers. Ah, don't used know them for, truck drivers. Exactly, everyone yeah, truck drivers. You know, so, um, <laughs> you know, a thermos with coffee. I don't know about that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be jumping with a thermos and have it explode in midair. But... um. I know, I know we're getting long in the tooth here, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell y'all something else that I've been thinking about lately about Cooper. One thing I've thought about recently that's bugged me about D.B. Cooper. Cooper asked for the money in a knapsack, okay? Basically, a school book bag, if we, if, you know, knapsack, you know, a book bag. Yeah, which, and which they didn't do, and he the, wasn't happy with it. No, he wasn't. But the, the thought being, most people think what he was going to do is think about when you're in middle school and you and you wear your backpack backwards, right? You wear your backpack backwards, you know? Cooper probably was gonna wear it backwards and put the parachute on and strap the harness. I've tried it, I've tried it with my parachute, with my daughter's backpack. You put it on backwards and you can strap mm -hmm. straps over the over, over the front, right? And that, that, that money isn't going anywhere. It's kind of like a, 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 a baby bjorn sort of, right? It's in front of you, right? That's brilliant, honestly. But Cooper, for some reason, doesn't go, hey, go go grab a knapsack. Where's my damn knapsack? He bitches about it. He does bitch at Tina. He goes, where's my knapsack? But he doesn't go, go get me my knapsack. Off, you know, grab some from some kid in the in the terminal, right? Just get me a knapsack. I mean, they could have had his knapsack. I mean, they I mean they brought crew meals, they brought all kinds of shit for him, right? They could have brought his knapsack. Point. Instead, he, instead yeah. he improvises. Instead, he spends an hour and a half. Cooper is literally messing with this stupid MacGyver money bag thing from 6 p.m. In the shroud line. 7.30. It's all he's doing is cutting shroud lines and wrapping and rewrapping and no, oh, what am I going to do with this? Literally, the guy spends an hour and a half fixated on this fixated on this stupid money bag. When, when, when he could have just said, hey, go get me a knapsack. Isn't that weird? He just like it's almost like to me. That is weird. That I know that's me. a good never really. Yeah, and and you know we ha we have a um, his name is Jude Morrow. Jude Morrow is on the Facebook group now. Yeah, I've seen him. Jude is an group, yeah yeah Jude's an Irish. He's an Irish author. He has written uh, bestsellers. Uh, he has done TED talks. That's where uh, I've seen Irish it before. Author. Yeah. Yeah, and so, but and, and he and he is autistic. He's on. He, I mean, he admitted. He's. He, I mean, he's, he's on the spectrum a little bit, and um, he sees a lot of autism. I mean, he's a autism author essentially. That's what he, he writes about. He sees a lot of spectrumy behavior in Cooper, a lot, and he has all these indicators. That's interesting. I, yeah, I see it. I see it too a little bit because that's like autism, autism. You know, or or, or o c d OCD, like OCD. Really just. Yeah. have to make it right. Like, yeah, but that is kind yeah, of exactly like, like Cooper is instead of instead of just saying, hey, get my knapsack. He gets like target fixation on this stupid bag. He spends he wastes an hour and a half yeah. doing this. He's like, I'm going to I'm going to do this by God. I'm going to do it. And like so it's like totally like yeah. distracted from the world. It's bizarre. And it is Cooper, bizarre. Like loses Cooper. Once Cooper gets his money. His attitude is so different. Like, think about this. He says, I want to take off with the stairs down. 
And the pilots go, well, we can't do that. He goes, well, yeah, you can. And instead of saying, yeah, you're going to do it because I'm telling you to. He goes, well, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, he goes, okay, whatever. Then when they're like, yeah. oh, we can't fly to Mexico he City. Relented. Yeah, he relented. He relents when they're like, we can't make it to Mexico City. He goes, well, okay, whatever. Uh, you know, I guess, I guess Reno's fine. You know, I mean, like he's, he becomes he becomes very passive after he gets the money. In fact, think about this. Good point. The briefcase is never mentioned again. Okay, this is a guy who kept his hand in the briefcase at all times, right? Well, once the passengers are gone, the brief the next time the briefcase yeah. is even mentioned is Tina saying, "Hey, are you going to take that with you?" He goes, "Oh, oh yeah, I will." You know, like it's like in there a bomb yeah. in there, you know? Now. We have started yeah, coming around. I wish he had left that. It would have been one more thing. What was funny is, is during Heineman's hijacking, Heineman had a attache case bomb, right? During his hijacking, he left it in the plane, and uh, the crew saw it and threw it out over the ocean. And uh, I'm sure the FBI mm-hmm. was very <laughs> pleased about that. Like, you dummies! <laughs> you know? Yeah. They're like, it, they said, for <laughs> our sake. our evidence. We, yeah, it says yeah, for it the could have been like, sake, it, it says they just bought the, the attache material. case. Yeah, they did. They jet- Although they did find Heinemann's luggage in the plane with his underwear listed as Heinemann on it. I mean, it, this guy was crazy. Heinemann was nuts. I mean, he left his clothes in the plane. I yeah, mean, he was nuts. He was, yeah. Yeah, he was but, doing yeah, I mean, what you said, like not doing what Cooper was doing. He yeah, was demanding. But, but, but Cooper's gonna target get this. Is, is very, very strange. Uh, the knapsack thing is just strange, right? Why, we, why didn't just demand it? Hey, where's my knapsack? You know, I've never, that, that's a weird thing that I've caught recently. Like, it's kind of strange, you know? So I think some people are, did you freeze? There, there you are. Okay, I thought you froze for a second. But yeah, so any, anything else to discuss? I, I'm still here. Yeah, froze. No, that's a great thing. So yeah, I'll wrap it up. I know we've been going a long time, but I uh, wanted to, since you shared yours, I was going to share my. Oh, uh, the my Clayton Shuffle. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. AKA the Cleveland shuffle. So we take off from Seattle and you got Walter Recapeca is, is on board. You know, he's, he's in the DB Cooper role, DB Cooper seat. He, uh, he, he jumps out at Clay Ellum and then he shaves his mustache before he's seen by Jeff Osai, Osai And then Braden manages to get, to, it comes out of the bathroom and he takes over. And then he makes okay. a beeline, hits the, you know, beats the flight path. And, and you know, so Braden's right. in. And at some point, Braden takes out his uh, his Gene Simmons model Cochrane boots. Know, so there's your height right there. Yeah, there's I, the boot. I, that's and genius. Then, and, then, it, and then Ted takes it all the way home. That's what, that's it's it funny. right there. I'm so happy you did the, I'm so happy you did the Gene Simmons boots because I told Lisa when Lisa was, oh, Lisa's still watching, hopefully. I told Lisa when she was she laughing, and she was like, oh, when she's like, oh, that she, when she goes, oh, those Cochrane boots are Ted's. I'm like, unless he had like David Bowie lifts, I don't think I don't think he's getting to six feet tall. They're, they're you right know there. What's crazy? You know what's the damnedest thing though about the height? Get this. McCoy, his stewardesses, McCoy was five foot ten. His I see some things where it said he was five eight, but yeah, well, he was five ten. It wasn't in his DDR. Hmm, his height's not. Well, that's weird. His stewardesses, though, I they they put can't remember McCoy, where I saw five eight, but they put McCoy. Two of them have McCoy at five foot five. What? Oh yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, like are they that off on height? Good lord. Yeah. Now McCoy had a weird yeah. like he had an odd shaped body. If you look at McCoy's photos of him in in, in like full size. He has this weird, like, um, McCoy, like, he kind of looks, I don't, he, his body, his body shape is strange looking. Like his, like his, his legs, his upper torso is way longer than his little stuff. He had little, really, he had, he had these, yeah, that's why, it, it, that's, yeah, he was. I mean, it, it is hard to judge height in a seating position. And it's not me just defending Braden, but it's true. It's you true. know, if I sit next to my daughter, who's 13, I look a lot taller than her, but she's actually taller than me. Uh, but you know it's all yeah. in her legs. But you know it's 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 not I have easy. grown I have grown more flexible on the height. The more I've studied the copycats, the more I've studied 
You know, I mean, think about this. Also about the swarthy stuff too. Look, Martin McNally. Yeah, they, were, yeah, is, they said Mike was swarthy. Irish. Martin McNally is Irish. Yeah, hits the he's name. A pasty white man. He's a pasty white man. Yet his FBI description, they say in the papers, swarthy, possibly Spanish or Mexican. Yep. Where the hell? Yeah, he didn't. Look, he's not even close. Come up with that. Yeah, Richard LaPointe was from Connecticut, white wasp from Connecticut. Richard LaPointe in the paper is listed as swarthy. Like, so do we really think that about Cooper? Yeah. I mean, yeah, maybe and some, we have this some swarthy past. something they just associated with a, a villain. Yeah, with well, that too. And also, we have passengers in the 302s. There's two different passengers saying, you know what? Maybe the lighting in the airplane was making me think he was darker than he is. Because we have passengers, witnesses admitting that. That's a good that. point. Yeah, that, that, that yeah. incandescent, what, I don't know what they call that lighting, but you know that. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that may have made it. does him have that weird effect. Better. Yeah, then, 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 then he really was. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you wrap up there. No, no, that, that's good stuff, man. I like it. You know, Battleground, all, I'm all for Battleground. The theory on the Tita bar is, is I, I liked what you said the best. I think that's probably what happened. It's plausible, isn't it? I mean, I think that explains yeah, a it's lot. It's very plausible. I mean, he, he was a generous guy. A generous guy would tip his getaway driver. Yeah, it, it just makes a lot of sense. You know, and a lot of people yeah. think T, uh, Tina Bar was a tip. Maybe uh, a shout out to Tina Makalo. But it's interesting. Bruce said that it's actually, you know, it was named after a guy named Tenna back in the day. Tenna. You know, Tenna was it's pronounced Tenna, not Tina, but um, one of those things, you know. But, it, I, you know, the mystery goes on. But yeah, with what sure. you're doing, I mean, you're overturning every stone. I mean, the battleground stuff, uh, the copycats is is really invaluable. I mean, that's going to be huge. Yeah. So that'll be the first book, right? Uh, no, or actually, it's the copycats. No, it'll be separate. The copycats is going to take longer because I had to file FOIAs um, for all of these uh, for all of uh, these uh, things. Max, look, Mac McNally's FOIA file is six thousand pages. <laughs> so, you know, wow. now there is a yeah, book. that's a lot to dig There's through. Even even though you know Mac personally, you still got to go through the file. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I, I have filed FOIAs for several of these. I, we have Heinemann's files. We have McCoy's files. We don't, I, but we don't have the other guys. And I've foia for them. So I have to wait to get those. Because I, mean, I don't want to write something that isn't the real scoop, you know, from the FBI. Um, but it's not, no, my book, D.B. Cooper, yeah, the FBI no, files. It's all, the, the little pieces you sent me are fantastic. I mean, stuff that people never. Yeah. yeah, and uh, Larry, uh, and some and, people uh, that Larry, never thought of, never knew it's going to clear up a lot of misconceptions. Yeah, and uh, Larry Carr is writing the forward to it, so I've got Larry Carr on my side. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Yep, all right. Well, I guess, and uh, signing off. awesome research as always, brother. We'll do it again soon, but uh. You're, I mean, you're uh, no stone unturned uh, where you're coming from. Yep. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, uh, good night. I feed her same. Adios. Choose. All right. Cedric. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Everybody bye. have a good night.